Welcome everybody to the stream. I am Bogus Meat Factory. Hi folks! How are you doing tonight? Sakura Kunonooni. Hi! <laughs> whoosh, whoosh. It's good to see you friends. How are you doing tonight? Tonight we were supposed to be doing some interactive fiction with my good friend Nick, but sadly he is super busy. End of the uh, semester stuff with his school, lots of grading. He's just busy, 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 busy. So no interactive fiction tonight. We will be next week though, hopefully for sure, fingers crossed. Where we start the Infocom game, Infidel, the one that a lot of people say is the worst. So I'm curious, we're Nicholas tonight. But so we're going to play some EverQuest. Um, typically, EverQuest is going to be Mondays, but uh, this Monday I have an engagement. I am uh, required by law to play my punishment for the video game Draft League. Um, so we're going to do a shmup that day, and then... Why not play request now? Uh, no, Kunanone, I talk about Enchanter constantly. My glasses are really crooked. I talk about Enchanter constantly. Uh, and so, but I'm playing a bard. I'm a Wood Elf bard, uh, right now. That is level 15? We're gonna try to go through Fallen tonight. Maybe. We'll see how that goes. If Hesh is around, he might be able... Oh, the Infocom game! No, we... So... I asked Nick, Hesh, how's it going, by the way? I asked my good friend Nick if he wanted to do the Enchanter series sequentially. Like, to, I mean, to do all three in a row and finish off the trilogy. Uh, he said no. He said he wanted to continue the chronological um, and wanted to really get to Infidel. We did finish Enchanter, Kunononi. Yes, we did. We did finish Enchanter quickly. That was a great game. That is easily, so far, my favorite um infocom game easily that was so brilliantly designed a tim machine says how much do you know about info infidel not a lick nick doesn't either but he is a archaeologist he's an archaeologist by trade um and so he's excited to be angry <laughs> It is still available, Kuno no Oni. You can actually check it on, on YouTube as well. All the stuff's on YouTube. Bogus Meat Factory. YouTube.com slash Bogus Meat Factory or whatever. It's all there. Um, we put up... I put it all up. And uh, it is worth watching. Oh! I cannot stress enough how great of a job they did in Enchanter. Because they did such a great ramp up in, in tension. And that final confrontation. Mwah. What... Ah, <sighs> being a giant fan of the Quest for Glory series, I love the the spellcaster in Quest for Glory because uh, I love Quest for Glory for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, mainly that the three classes represent three different types of players, where the fighter just fights his way through things. Very little in terms of puzzle solving outside of brute force. It's really a beginner class for people who don't have a lot of experience in, in adventure games. And then you have... The spellcasting class where you solve puzzles using a very limited set of tools that you almost get from the very beginning. And that's what you use to solve puzzles. And then you have the thief, which is like your hardcore adventure game fan. You're you're solving things with your wits. Um, and it's all about p solving puzzles the way that Sierra Adventure games are solved. And Enchanter feels very much like how the magic user is in Quest for Glory. You have those tools, you're collecting some more, and using those to solve puzzles, not, you know, the random inventory items. Uh, and Tim Machine says, It's interesting how Quest for Glory was a major influence on LucasArts' Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis game. Absolutely. And each class got their own content hash. Yes! You had a reason to replay. Um, so, yeah, Kununo Oni, uh... Two years ago? It's... Wow. Is it two years? No, it's a year and a couple months. Uh, December 2020 uh, was... Well, 2020 as, as a whole, I went through the whole series. So we did all the Quest for Glory games and had our thief... Uh, Wretch was his name. He went through the whole thing. Because I had played through one through four a million times, but I had never beaten five. I was like, I can't... I can't pull the trigger on that game because... It's um, it's not true quest for glory. I don't want it to come to a conclusion and not be the way I want it to be. Blah, 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 blah. Quest for Glory 5 ends up being one of my favorite quest for glory games. It was really good, especially for the thief. 
The combat, terrible. The the rights of rulership, the the first two rights of rulerships are uh, stuff is is, mm, eh. But the side stuff and the story and the characters were pure quest for glory. Some of the most memorable characters, I love them to death. Um, you know, uh, and I just I loved it a bunch. It ended up being really good. I'm weird. I really liked it a lot. And uh, so, yeah, I love Quest for Glory. It's my favorite Sierra adventure game series. Arguably my favorite adventure game series in general. But there's a whole lot of primo stuff like Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, uh, Loom. Like, those are all amazing. And Enchanter is crazy good. It's crazy good. I liked Planet Fall a bunch. Just because of, of Steve Moretzky making the world first. I feel like he made a, uh, the map. And, like, he had this idea. And he made, you know, a lot of rooms. Whoa, you never played four or five? So, Kuno no Oni, number four is my favorite. All time. Five is my second favorite. I should get out of my character just and do that at some point. Yes, you should. Yes. Go through it all. Four is my favorite all time of the quest for glory ones five is my second favorite um anyways we're ranting let's go play everquest we all don't know is that i played a little bit with hash on his stream um it's uh, yeah well that's the thing hash what what makes quest for glory so good well let's, we'll get to everquest in just a second i have to rant here i have to rant here hash what makes them so fantastic is that is that they aren't bound by the basic tropes of adventure game issues that Sierra falls into. <laughs> Sorry, chat. Uh, because they they base it off of their own, you know, RPG experiences, their tabletop RPG experiences. Um, and they really did build foresight in the world. They definitely planned how the games were going to progress. They didn't do this all on the fly. Um, and they, they designed them in such a way that is innovative, interesting, engaging, and puts characters in the forefront, um, more so than the puzzles. The puzzles are a gateway to the characters and to the story and to these amazing and interesting set pieces. Um, and they're all about the world and the characters. That's what they are. You know, it's it's a, such an interesting thing, and that's why I love it so much. It's so good, and just the way they designed puzzles for the three different classes to cater to those specific needs, having those little side quests that are unique to each class. Some of them are better than others uh, in, like, some games are like, this is clearly a better experience if you're a paladin than you are a thief, that sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah, and fair to the player, because also, ATM Machine, if you get a dead end... They're pretty straightforward in telling you, you messed up. You know, uh, Quest for Glory 2 maybe notwithstanding. Quest for Glory 2 is a little, the ticking clock. A lot of people aren't aware of it until it happens. And it's kind of a drag in that, in that regard. I'd say Quest for Glory 2 is probably the least fair out of all five games. But, you know, it's still not bad. I used to really like Quest for Glory 2, and I'm starting to like it less and less in comparison. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. ATM Machine. Oh, my gosh, yes. Also, great, great Easter eggs. Oh, d the mini games, Dude. The mini games are fantastic. They're so much fun. I, I love the throwing knives game in all of the Quest for Glory. Quest for Glory 5, Quest for Glory 1. Love the throwing knives. Um, the, the wizard... Um, maze thing in Quest for Glory wasn't so good. Which one do you think gave the most opportunities for thieves to just go steal stuff unattached to any storyline stuff? <clears throat> that would probably be Quest for Glory 1. Quest for Glory 1, I would say, does. Uh, if we want to rank Quest for Glory games, my ranking of Quest for Glory games is Quest for Glory 4, Quest for Glory 5, Quest for Glory 1, Quest for Glory 2, Quest for Glory 3. 4 is 
back to the basics of what makes Quest for Glory 1 so interesting. Um, a small area to explore, uh, intimate interactions with characters that they take the forefront, the quests revolve around them very specifically. Whereas in Quest for Glory 2, it's much more grandiose and, and, and uh, a bigger scale thing, but you lose sight of a lot of the characters. Quest for Glory 3 um, <clears throat> has some great character moments, but the world is too big and too empty. It doesn't it doesn't feel like there's much there. You know, there's not a lot of in a lot of there's not a lot of set pieces. You know, you have Tarna, the Simbani village, uh the tree and ruins. And that's it. Like that that's all you got. Whereas in like Quest for Glory 1, I mean, you got Baba Yaga's hut, you got uh Erasmus's, you know, tower, you've got uh Sp Spielberg in general, the castle, you have, you know, uh, the, the meeps, you have all these things that really stand out. I'm derailing me so I can get my shaman ready into my banking inventing. <laughs> Not a problem, Hesh. Um, but for real though, uh, four and five are really good. A lot of people will crap on five. I think that they're mis misled, that they are, they're coming from a point of like prejudice towards it. Not being my quest for glory. Look, it's character focused. Uh, the interface, the combat system, yeah, not very good. But it's dialogue writing, it's character focus, it's story, interesting, engaging. I loved it. The thief was pre uh, particularly fantastic. The side quests and things that you would do in that was great. And my final choice in that game, very true to character. <laughs> there's a lot of um, open, like, there's a lot of things that you can do in that game that makes the ending distinctly yours. And it's a great culmination of what you have built uh, throughout the entire series. It's really good. It's really good. I digress, though. I digress. Um, let's play some EverQuest, and we will, of course... Oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? We'll talk about some... We'll talk about Text Adventures. We will talk about Text Adventures. Let me move my windows around, sorry. Not poor planning. I didn't expect this. Alright. See, now, Hash, you say, while you get yourself ready, do some banking and some vending, I need to do some as well. Taldio says, just stopping in to say hi. Taldio, it is good to see you, my friend. We're jumping in. West Freeport right now. I got a question for all you Everquestian folks. Is the drum the only one that um uh the drum the only one like can I hold a harp in my secondary slot? Hash says you'll wait at the easy tunnels. Excellent. I'm well buffed out. I don't even know where I got these these buffs. Oh, this might have been all from Hash before we left. I have to find the bards. I'm so lost in Freeport, I'm going to consult a map. Um, let's find, let's find Freeport. Let's see, I got to find the bards. I haven't bought any instruments and I need to, you know? Um, okay, so North Freeport. And let's see, it is, okay, I can get there easy. That's no problem. Turn 180 degrees. Yes, it does depend on the song. Does that blonde elf from the various covers uh, back in the day actually show up anywhere? ATM machine? That is uh, Firiona V, I believe. Am I right in this? I'm pretty sure. They actually appear in the comics. Um, I believe the character appears at some point in other places as well. I might be crazy, though. There's the Bard Guild. She has a giant statue, yep, named after her. Yes. In um in Furion V on the way to uh Kunark. Hi. I'd like to buy an instrument. Felicity Starbright, you got any instruments? No. Okay, let's see. Do you have any instruments? No. 
Not you. How about Jekyll? Hey, Jekyll. All right, Jekyll's got some stuff. Let's see. Um, so the horn. So this is what, yeah, so you can hold these in your secondary. All right, I just got to know what my spells, what they, so that's singing, stringed instruments, singing, stringed instruments, singing, singing, percussion, stringed. Okay, so I just need a stringed instrument, it looks like. Okay. So that is, the lute is. What's the difference here between a mandolin and a lute? Any difference? Oh, yeah. ATM machine, absolutely. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a good, I think it was a good poster, like, poster child for the, for the game, you know? I think it was. There we go. Look at that. I emptied out all my stuff. Eat my chunk of meat. My rat ears. Oh, I got some stuff to sell. I got some stuff to sell. The Damask Sash. So what is this? It's just an AC2. Why is it sell for... I guess it doesn't sell for so much. It's just a couple gold. There we go. I gotta sell all this stuff. I don't need it. I think it's pronounced Damusk with the emphasis on the first syllable. It could be. I don't entirely know what that is. Hold on. Okay, so I need that's just like the, the sword. Or with the drums. I have to have it. Okay, my hand free. It's not one-handed. That's good to know. It's a patterned fabric. Oops. Yes, I do want to drop the vegetables. Thank you. Made of silk. Okay. So I'm level 15. We're going to try to go back to... Um, So what had happened in the previous, I had played some with uh, Hesh on his stream, where we went to Befallen and failed miserably. But it's all my fault. I will say quite clearly, it is all my fault. <laughs> and I take full responsibility. We're going to check to see if Befallen's working. It's a double-sided woven fabric. Used for wallpaper, sometimes for dresses. Interesting. I knew not any of these things. I have a bunch of random loot, random money. You learn something new every day. Oh, look at this. So majestic. Oh, he left. Dang it, he was camping. I didn't get to tell him he was majestic. Okay, you're a geek. You know about punch cards, right? Early computer punch card programs? Absolutely, tell you. Yes. Did someone make a punch card for this game? <laughs> oh, my poor internet is crashing on me. Oh, man. So punch cards were originally used in jacquard looms, used to weave uh, damask. Damask. Interesting. So one of the things I need to do is at some point off stream invest in gear because <laughs> I'm wearing still like cloth, small cloth shawls and stuff like this. I need to invest. First syllable emphasis, damask. 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 <laughs> Am I doing it right? I doing it right? I don't know. Sorry, buddy. 
Ready for some Dark Elf Mask? <gasps> okay, so Mod Wolf, Mod Wolf, if I do the Dark Elf Mask, how what what is entailed in this? Cause maybe is do I do I actually is it something that I can honestly get, or is that something that I am just along for the ride? I'm very curious. I <laughs> Hesh, you want to go get a, a dark elf mask? I'm oh man, this is uh, I'm I am terrified. I'm legitimately anxious. My palms are sweaty at the mere thought. Mod Wolf, I know not. You'd be along for the ride, okay? Well, Hesh, do you want to go for along with me on a ride to go get a dark elf mask and guck? I don't know what this entails. Talia says you could have just rolled a dark elf to start with. We're going to draw so much level of aggro. I know. Well, no, we wouldn't actually. We'd be along for the ride, though. Hi. How's it going, Hesh? I'm just... Mod Wolf's going to kill everything. Invite. I mean, is the stuff two rooms over that doesn't aggro him will aggro us. This is true. Male skirts are so in this season. They are! This is Hesh's person. I believe in them. Hesh is like, you know... I don't know if playing every quest is a good idea with you. You always end up getting us killed. We make no progress. I'm so anxious. They're always in. They're always in. When wouldn't they be in season? Mod Wolf, I'm I am willing. Uh but I don't know how to get there. Or what to do. What how would I get there? I am I'm game. It's not about progress, it's about chaos. That's right, Sakura. That's right. How do you tunnel fat cats? Look at all these tunnel fat cats. The urge to just bring in a uh, a griffin right now is very high. Northern Desert Row to Oasis to Southern Row to Ith... Uh, in the Thule Swamp to Guck. And I'll meet you at Guck. Hesh says they know the way. Is there a place that we can bind that is closer than here? I don't know the bind locations, but I'm very curious. Also, Hesh, how are you doing, by the way? Oh, Hesh, you you got a couple levels under your belt. Okay, Freeport is closest. All right, well, then the, I know you got to go through here to get to the Northern Desert Row. And then it's just you go like south, south, and south. You kind of follow the water line, right? In this instance, am I crazy in, in this thought process? I think that's the case. Because I remember when Nick and I, we had to do a quest to get some stuff with the halflings. And what we needed to do was gather... Um, uh, stuffing from the scarecrows in the western plains of Karana and take that to be blessed by a priest of Kazakh Thule in uh, just outside of Ogok um, in uh, the Firat and we had to go I think that way I'm pretty sure <laughs> poor Hesh is like we're gonna die this is a terrible idea and I'm into it. All right, Hash, I like it. I like that you're on board, Hash. I am I am on board with you being on board. Me and my cloth... My cloth shawl. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's a real problem. That's That needs to be addressed at some point. I don't know what's good for bards. Not an excellent saber-toothed tiger hide, though. I know that. Ooh. Can we stop off for evil eye bags on the way down? What does that entail? Tell me more. 
Hesh, can we stop off for evil eye bags on the way down? Pray tell. Oh. Pray tell what does. What evil eye bags do you speak of? <laughs> Alright, sorry. I'm supposed to be following Hesh. I don't even know where Hesh is. I lost Hesh. Hesh! Are you still in the tunnel? A weight reduction bag. 30%, I think. I'm coming up behind you now. Okay. How do you get an evil eye bag? I mean, isn't my small box and small bag clearly enough? <laughs> That's the thing. My guy doesn't have any issues. I'm going to do slash follow. I'm slash following you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, my guy doesn't have enough weight capacity. Like, I'm almost already at my weight allowance. I might have a drink or two on the way. Just taking a swig of brandy before we go for good luck. I'm still following you, but I'm just a little bit tipsy. Like, I can't carry enough. His strength is not good enough. I can carry just, like, 75 pounds worth of stuff. I'm going to see how a Hesh does this, too, because I... It's up to our tour guide, really, but there's an evil eye sort of on the way to the mask that drops the bag. Ooh, okay. There's the wonderful... Barbarian fishermen. Ah, the desert barbarians. A rare breed. It isn't on the way, says Modwolf. I thought he, we were Songnesty. Now we're this guy in a chain muscle. No, AT machine. We're in first person perspective. There's Songnesty. He's a little drunk right now, so he's kind of swaying back and forth just a tad. We are following my good friend Hesh Ballantyne, who is Musadel. That is, the guy in the chainmail skirt. can't change the view because I'm drunk. There we go. See? Whee! <laughs> That's a guy slowly swaying. Whee! Okay, so yes. Interesting, okay. So yeah, this was terrifying for us. Especially because, like, not for Nick necessarily when we took this journey. Because Nick could bind himself wherever he wanted. So he could just bind himself in the fear rot. But, like, there was a, a roaming assassin uh, that was wandering in the area where this priest was that we were looking for. And he would just want to kill you if he found you. And so we were so, like, screwed just trying to dodge this guy and work around him. Uh, Nick just would bind himself near the bridge in the fear rot that led us over to where that priest is supposedly located. Finding him was very challenging. Because he's just this little lizard dude running around in this big old swamp. Ah, ah whoa, whoa, hold on. Hold on, okay. Let me just follow you. Hello. Do not use this around lava, water, cliffs, or other dangerous areas because you will fall into them. You have been warned. Auto follow works best in wide open areas with low lag, twisty areas, lag, and other factors may cause auto follow to fail. Look, we're in the Caymans. So this is the Oasis of Mar. Still a little tipsy. Dude, that, uh... That brandy really did a number on me. Eventually, I'll be completely unaffected by booze.
I've never seen the old man. Lots of people fighting. Whoa. Crocodiles here. Wow. That's a lot of people. Why are they fighting all the crocodiles? I guess that's just something for the decent camp there. Yeah. All right. I'm down. The sand scarab looks at me dubiously. Because, yeah, I'm level 15. One level away from the highest level I've ever been. And I'm still grossly incompetent in this game. <laughs> Crocs are nice since they don't social. Oh, really? So they so you can't pull others. They just it's just that one when you pull them, which is nice. Not a bad way to go. Um, yeah, I I think that one of the the goals that I need to do is to learn how to. How to pull. I really don't know how to pull. We tried on Hesh's thing and I failed dramatically. Catastrophically. You have a, I have a lull, right? So when I cast the lull, and it says, like, oh, hey, they're, um, you know, they're feeling sad. And then I go to attack the, or pull the other mob. The other thing still comes and attacks me. So, like, I don't know, am I supposed to just let it ride and do, like, a couple ticks? Like, what, what's the goal there? How do you know when it's time to pull them, the other person? It lasts, like, 15 seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> but, it, like, it says, it says, you know, it, it worked. And it's still so... The mob you pull doesn't go through the lulled one. Okay. It just reduces the radius. So, the, when the lull wears off, are they pulled? Then at that point, is that what happens? Like, no matter what, that other one's going to come in. Uh, if I've, I've lulled them, grab that other mob. Is the lulled one, when it wears off, coming? No? Okay. Because, like, there was an instance where I lulled something, and when I did the lull, it brought a mob, like, a whole bunch of people. Oh. Yeah, we got, we got, so. Just goes back to normal. Okay. I'm learning these things, Mod Wolf. It's a process. Oh, that's a good sword. The Combine Empire. No, I didn't pull that one. I just feel like I completely botched it. Just leading me to madness. Best place to be is a sacra. So we're still. We're in South Row now, okay. It's just me and Hesh in this zone. Nobody's in the South Row. Oh, poor South Row. <laughs> the jump. Prepper Guck will want to just invite past to lower. Then in lower, I'll murder everything. Invis past. Wow, I can't read. Mad Eyes says, I'm still hoping to get groups in Gook or Paw. Mad Eyes? I don't know. I mean, Mod Wolf question. 
what level would we be need to be to do even like the basic guck stuff guck stuff okay hesh is gonna need a minute when we get to guck i believe you we will be okay low 20s okay totally not our time i just want to have this fancy mask i want to turn into a dark elf whenever i want now other real question if i turn into a dark elf does that make me kos in places this is important information that I need to know because I will without with great certainty accidentally leave that thing on my yeah on my person he's a marathon runner apparently yeah oh yeah absolutely you can enter evil cities though yes this this I like so then Mod Wolf, if I'm entering in those cities with that, that means I can do quests to raise my status with them. So is it then theoretical that I wear that mask, grind quests, and then take the mask off, and I will be good in that city? Yes. This. This. Is. Oh. I don't entirely know if I can convey the level of excitement that that brings me because I'm a bard I need I look I gotta perform I gotta perform the dark hills have some easy quests for factions you'll have fun exploring very awesome oh look at the little mushroom guy he's so cute oh he just got hailed Oh, go back, Hesh. I got myself a mushroom. Oh, far too kind. Thank you very much. Augmentation. Buffing randoms inside. Uh, figure I'd get you as well. Greatly uh, appreciated. You beautiful gnome. Okay. Following hash. Not getting stuck on a tree, though. Not getting stuck on a tree. Okay. We're going in. I've never been here. Dwarven Dad, how's it going? I've never been here. I've never really explored the Dark Elf City. I don't like the Dark Elves, but I love what they represent. Okay. Hash needs a second. BRB. Okay. So Mod Wolf... I'm guessing you're Wormney. That's my guess. Oh, jeez. We're floating. Dead man floating. Yep. Do I invite you then? You want to be part of the group? Or is that not how this works? I don't know what we need for this. Dwarven Dad says all are trash. Exactly, Dwarven Dad. But that's why we infiltrate them. Okay. I am legitimately terrified. I feel like I am going to die horrifically and unequivocally, like uh, uh, dramatically. Does Hesh have invis? I don't think so. Not I can just kill everything on the way. I don't think so. Nope. No, it is. But yes, Robin Dad, I think you're right. Elves are trash, which is why I'm a wood elf bard. <clears throat> he has an identity crisis. Okay, Dwarven Dad, he wants to be loved by all races. <laughs> and uh, that's why... Um, that's why we are going to be uh, taking on many different faces and masks to gain the love 
and attention of those around us. Oh, wow. Okay. I guess we're going. Okay. Oh, okay. How do, how, how do, okay. Okay. I'm learning. Can I fly up? I don't know how any of this works. I am following the skeleton. Hey, she coming? I'm getting so mixed up. Clan is crashing. Go on without me. Okay, Hesh, no worries. We're here. I don't know. Okay. What way did you go? Did you go this way? No. You're there. I see you. Hesh says, go on without us. We got it, Hesh. No worries. How long will this take is another true question. I wonder what it's like. Wood song. Oh, wood song. It can be either the first kill and be up. In, okay, interesting. Interesting. The wonderful world of necromancers. You guys and your wonderful little toys. What's up with these flaming skeletons? ATM machine. That is uh, Modwolf, who is a Ixar necromancer. They are using some major buffs to get me deep into the realm of Guck, the home. Well, not the home of the Froglocks, but the current fortress of the Froglocks. Um, these spiders I could take. They're blue to me, right? And. Uh, we are on the way to get a Dark Elf mask that I can wear to take on the form of a Dark Elf and gain access to the evil cities. All these poor frog locks. Look at them. They're so cute. Why would anyone want to hurt them? Although they do have a bunch of skulls. So, let's see. The... Frog, oh man, look at these guys. This is amazing. Guck is beautiful. Look at all these weird mouth, mouth cauldrons. Yeah, the frog looks like me. Oh yeah, because they're apprehensive. Yeah. Wormney, they're apprehensive. That's all. I hope so. Yeah, they're just apprehensive. Okay. So we're going in here. So was this, was Guck originally the home of the trolls and the frog lugs took it from them? I forget. I forget what the lore is. I feel like that was the case. I could be completely wrong, though. Something like that, yes. There are some minotaurs living in there, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, don't fall. I feel like I'm gonna, even though I have the floating thing. I feel like it's an inevitability.
Yeah. I am not going to be drinking anything. Okay. It's so pretty. You're so majestic, Rumney. So majestic. Oh, okay. Ooh. Hi, people. Goodbye, people. All right, here we go. This may be different. They may attack me here. I don't know. I don't know what's down here. This is what? Lower Guck? Ruins of Old Guck. I don't know what's here. Now here, you want to stay behind me. I got it. Okay. I am behind you. I'm staring at that delightful prehensile tail. Bigger pet time. Oh, this is a popular place. Killing Minotaurs. Zabobin. This is the dead side of Guck. Everything will attack you. Okay. So this is like where the undead remain. Okay. Heathen unbeliever North must be cleansed. Interesting. Yeah, I'm just staying back until this room is cleared out. Earl! So, I am being taken through the depths of Lower Guck. The ruins of the troll city that was uh, taken over by the froglocks and claimed by them. Creations of Nathaniel Mar, I believe. Okay, coming. Just taking it slow. Slightly terrified. Um... And we are going to gather a mask that will transform me. Okay. They root on hit. Um, to get a mask that will transform me into the shape of a dark elf. And give me access to the evil uh, cities. Chainmail skirt guy, Hesh. Uh, his client cr crashed. He's outside now. Doing Hesh, awesome Hesh things. Look at these guys. Ghoul Knights. Shin Ghoul Knights. It's like the Majora's Mask? I wish, Earl. <clears throat> okay, so I can follow you. I'm just scared. I'm so scared. Here we will swim. Okay, we will swim. My swim speed is terrible. Where did you go? There you are. You swim so much faster than me. Okay. Okay, following. I'm, I'm definitely trying to keep up. Okay. Look at these guys. Greater bones. Ice bones. I'll stick around for a bit in case you get a quick drop. Exactly, Hesh. So, Earl, it's good to see you. Yeah, um, the friend with the fancy tail is Mod Wolf. They are helping me. Do they're doing this for me as a, as a favor. Just to give me this thing. This is I should not have this mask. I should not have this mask at all. Um, and they're going to help me get this thing. I'm in a place that I should not be in. <laughs> this is too dangerous for me. Way too dangerous for me. I do not stand a chance in a place like this. This is for... I don't know. What, what is the, the, the ruins here? What level is for this place? Typically. Like I'll con it. It's red. Uh, 
This is terrifying. The stuff at the end is blue to me. Whoa. Worm knee. The fantastic. The stuff at the end is blue to him. Oh crap. Oh crap. Shit. Help. Help. I'm gonna die. Oh no. Hesh saw that coming. I didn't see it coming. I said to stand behind him. I stood behind him. Should have wagered on. Oh, we should have wagered on that happening. <laughs> Hold on. Where am I going? Uh, it'll be just easier for me to go to the comments. I can res ya. How does that work? Does that summon me? Okay. Okay. I have to make it back there. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, I get a bunch of XP back and get summoned back. That's expensive, isn't it? That that costs that takes a long time to do. I feel like that's a might have to be in the zone. I think I might have to be in the zone. Somebody sowed me. Thank you, whoever sowed me. Thank you for the sow. Now you're good? Okay. Get in the zone. Auto zone. Necro can res. Urban artifact beer. Yes. And welcome. It's good to see you. How are you today, my friend? They can. Now you're good. How does this work? Okay. Wants to cast convergence. I just got sucked. <laughs> I just got sucked. Through a straw. Okay. Alright. I'm going to move very slowly. And be absolutely terrified. You stay here. Okay, I'm staying right here. Now I'm moving a muscle. Oh, I got to loot my corpse. Where's my corpse? Is it already resurrected? Where's my corpse? There it is. I don't know how any of this works. I'm so sorry, Mod Wolf, that I have cost you all this time and effort on such a lowly worm such as I. Oh yeah, I'm now greatly... I'm, uh... Yeah, I can't move. I'll just wait until everything fixes itself. Will these things respawn on top of me? I hope not. I'm very scared. <laughs> I'm so scared. I'm hearing the croaks. I hear the croaks. They're coming for me. Yep. Okay. 20 minutes. Just sit there. Okay, I will, I will just sit. Right here. <laughs> Skeletons like you are better left dead than alive. Well, I mean, they're not really dead or alive. You know, they're kind of undead. It's not the same. You would think they would do something about the smell. Log locks have noses, right? <laughs> it's pretty pretty stinky in here. Extremely natural sitting animation here. I yeah, absolutely. I don't understand what the problem is. Like I'm I am sitting just fine. Look at me. Sitting just fine. I'm comfortable. Gargoyle eyes.
I can move slowly now. Wait. Oh, geez. Okay, those are corpses. It is for your Bard Lambent Breastplate quest. Loot this Basil gar Basil Gargoyle. Okay. The Basil Carapace. Right? Not the Rune of Relis Zek. Just the... Yeah, the Carapace. Okay. Good, good, good. I got the Carapace. The Bard Lambent Breastplate Quest. Gonna pull ahead. You chill. I am chilling right here, staring at these very intimidating gargoyle corpses. They may be dead, but they look like they're very much alive. I'm gonna be alright, though. Just gonna stare in terror. <laughs> staring in terror. So... I once dated a gargoyle. For being made of stone. They did not get me hard. <laughs> the inappropriate joke. The stairmaster. I am the stairmaster. Can you defeat my riddles? Hi folks, how are you doing? This is the great moment when we're waiting here. I am a level 15 wood elf bard. I am currently in lower guck. And uh, waiting while they pull and kill things in the distance. Uh, some people will scream and cry... Uh, shenanigans, shame on you for being a person who is getting something that you shouldn't get to at this level. Here's what I have to say. Um, it's just a game, and all it is is a mask so that I can go to Evil Towns, because that's just what I want to do. I'm not like, I need it. Exactly. Who? Like, some people would be very upset at this. Sakura, some people would be very upset at this. You dead son, rip. That's what I say. Like, we're just playing a game. And, like, I'm not going to be going into, like, hardcore, you know, raid things. I would go into raids with people with the sole and express purpose of just watching it happen and not fucking it up. <laughs> I hope I'm lost. You're dead. Rip. Help, I'm lost! You dropped your pocket. Wow, someone said you dropped your pocket. That is like a very 1990s teenage thing to say. Is this the way to Akanon? Yes, it is. <laughs> Do you know the way to Akanon? Ba da 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 da. That is, like, do you know the way to San Jose? Okay, let's move up. Okay, I'm moving up. Oh, look at this mouth. I'm hearing things. I'm hearing the sloshing. Stay in this room I'm in. Okay. Oh, my God. It's just a cacophony of sounds. I have it kind of low on your guys' end. Nick says, hello, just finished emailing 40 parents. Okay, I'm not leaving this room. I am going to enjoy the wonderful amenities of harpoons and netting. Uh, and really admiring just the froglock craft. Look at how they made these walls with little footprints. It's a game. Play it how you want. Exactly. Exactly, Kunanoni. I'm just apologizing for anyone who's coming in here being like, you, you power leveling asshole. It's like, I'm not power leveling. Just get a stupid mask to look like an evil guy. Nick, how many people did you have to email to say your child is failing? Real talk. Real talk. Urban Artifact, I am 15. 
I'm in Lower Guck right now, and I'm scared to death. Wormy takes a bite from a drake egg. From a dragon egg. From a cockatrice egg. Wow. Do those make good omelets? About 40. Nick, we're getting... I'm, I am being given a mask that will uh, allow me to take on the form of a dark elf and get access to the evil cities while still being a good person. Including these. Oh my gosh. I ate them hard boiled. Whoa. Makes sense. Okay, this spot up here is the safe spot. Right, so I'm following you then. Okay. Following you. Okay. Right here. Safe spot. This torch. Okay. I'm not moving. This torch. Right here. Got it. Not moving. If you can, use hide too. Alright, let me see if I know hide. I do! I begin to hide. I think I'm hidden. <laughs> okay, I've hidden. Good person, exactly. It says you begin to hide. Oh, I'll try it again. Okay. You begin to hide. There you go. Okay. I got a D in Hyde class. Zara, I'm scared. <laughs> Your high school's what I'm guessing. The room with the spawn is up this ladder. I killed the placeholder, so we wait on the respawn. Okay, I don't want to know what the real world analog to that mask would be. Well, Nick, um, to give you. Uh, a a comparison the so remember that quest that I discovered that we that was a, an undocumented quest um, the dark elves have a parallel quest that or not a parallel I guess it's a one that intersects with the one that we had discovered where they have to find that halfling messenger and what they have to do is pose as a halfling and they do so by wearing a skin mask of a halfling. I got kids getting D's in biology. Oh, man. Please do. I need to keep a heightened sense of anxiety at all times. <laughs> Undocumented quest. Aren't there any websites that mention things like that? That or all the other dead? A tam machine. So, um, Alakazam and the Project 1999 wiki are both major sources of information on the quest and EverQuest. Um, and there is a, uh, but there was not any documentation on this quest in particular. There's no uh, record of it being done on Alakazam on Project 1999. Um, or in any forums or anything like that. And it's because it uh, it relies on the use of a a NPC, a named NPC that is typically um, not there because there's a placeholder NPC in its spot. And you have to be an evil race to kill that placeholder for that good one to spawn, for the person to turn in that quest. Um and there's a dark elf quest that is related to that, right? So being a good race, being a ha uh, quote unquote good race, being a halfling, you can do this quest uh, that they're asking. There's a there's a halfling messenger in the common lands, and they um they need a, de a message delivered to the halfling druids that are held up in um these cursed forests that are just outside of uh, Nereak, the Dark Elf City, there's a halfling druid that to deliver this message to. And you can deliver that message. 
that's the quest that's undocumented. As a dark elf, there's a situation where they're like, hey, there is a halfling messenger out in the common lands, and um, we want to intercept the message. Wear this skin mask to pose as a, as a halfling. Get that message and bring it back to us. And you you do, and they're like, I need you to kill this NPC. And you learn that there are spies in Nariac. Um, there's a spy in Nariac somewhere, a halfling spy. And you have to locate and kill that halfling spy. Uh, but if you are a halfling, you just deliver that message to that right person, and they talk about their situation in Nariac and that sort of stuff. It's really cool. It's really cool. I uh, was super surprised that no one had done that. I mean, somebody has done that. I'm positive somebody has done that quest. Just nobody documented it. There's a lot of stuff, ATM Machine, in EverQuest that is untested, that is undocumented, that is undiscovered still to this day because it requires very certain um, criteria. And sometimes there are quests that um, are things that hint at being a quest they have dialogue and things like this, but maybe bugged and don't work or were unfinished other times. And so it's hard to discern what is and isn't, uh, especially for a lot of quests. They aren't very um, worth doing because they don't really give you rewards that meet the level and difficulty of actually doing that quest. So a lot of people just don't do it. They just work on mobs and worry about gear. For me, I'm always about doing those quests. That stuff really excites me. It interests me. It engages me in the world in a big way. So I love to hail everybody that I can and try to get as much info as I can. Vexnell says, is that Ixar a monk or the necromancer? It is a necromancer. And how are you doing, by the way, Vexnell? Welcome. It is good to have you. Yeah. If it's a neck, which cloth home has the Ixar plate model? Because I want it badly. That is a question for Mod Wolf. I know nothing. <laughs> I am, uh, look, I'm level 15. The highest level I've ever been is level 16. I spend a lot of time exploring the cities and talking to NPCs and just digging into the lore and into, like, the, the smaller intimate stories of these games. So I want that Velius XR plate model helm on my XR Necromancer. Model says KT Crown, Dane Crown, or Cowl of Mortality off Zelandi. That's the answer. Vexnal Modwolf is Wormney in the chat. So that they are uh, experts in this. I am a mere apprentice learning the most basics of how to play this game. I don't even know how to pull mobs. I'm I am absolutely terrified. I have no no knowledge of these things. Looted Carnelian or Chameleon. So we are simply waiting in an attempt to get a mask that makes me look like a dark elf so that I can get access to the evil cities. One of the big reasons why I picked a bard was because I wanted to, there was, there's two major choices here for me was to be a bard or to be an enchanter um, because en enchanters in the game can take the form of, of multiple different people. Um, but, and then I learned that Bard has this mask they can get. And Mod Wolf is beyond kind enough to be like, I can get you that mask. Like, let's do it. And so I am now sitting patiently, trying not to pee myself out of fear and anxiety, which is purely natural for me. It's my natural state of existence. as they work on taking care of these guys and getting things to happen. <clears throat> Vexnel, what are you doing? <clears throat> what uh, character do you play? Are you doing an XR um, Necromancer or an XR and a Monk? What you play? I've never been to Kunark at all. Very nice. Very nice. I've never been to Kunark in my life. I spent Fear Anxiety is what makes EverQuest EverQuest. Exactly, Urban Artifact Bird. This is exactly the case. Um, I spend a lot of time in Kinos. <laughs> and not much else. Because I I love I love Kino so much. Um the risk of oh dude, absolutely. 
uh, EverQuest is a dangerous game. And what's so funny, one of the things that I stress to people, you know, there's always that 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 conversation about, you know, like um, uh, Dark Souls games, right? About the, the dangers and challenges of a Dark Souls game and why it's so fulfilling because it's 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 hard it's challenging it's punishing but it's also rewarding once you understand the intricacies of its of its uh, mechanics and how things work and intertwine and and stuff like this and you get access to a world of lore and world building at a level that's you know unprecedented and i'm like you should really check out everquest <laughs> it is i uh, you know it is punishing dangerous always dangerous and but you actually do get a sense of accomplishment out of it a lot of people emphasize you know uh gear and things like this and while that is one facet to it that is like th for me the lowest priority i don't do i don't care about gear and and min maxing and that sort of stuff for me it's really all about just exploration discovery and uh, playing around with the very silly tools that they give you. So, like, for instance, uh, Vexnel, when I, I play, so, like, as an enchanter, I love t using Minor Illusion and turning into random props within the zone and just spinning and, like, being silly and, like, trying to get people to sign up for my two-week adventuring correspondence course or having um, a friend be a druid and turn into tree form and try to get people to pay me money for to consult this fortune telling tree <laughs> like that's my that's my life that's how i play this game i don't get very far i don't but i love making a bunch of different characters exploring the cities and and hailing all the the characters and learning the stories and this is really my first attempt at wanting to uh dramatically change uh, how I play the game by getting to a higher level so that I can see more of this world because I d haven't, I haven't seen much of anything. Um, I've seen the major cities and the newbie zone surrounding them. I've never been in a dungeon. So Guck is really the first like dungeon I've, I've seen. Earl says, what about the elegant funeral service? Yes. Yes. Running funeral services for bodies that are just minutes away from disappearing. Um, and so we absolutely, have some fun with this game because that is that is part of the beauty of this game when we talk about like emergent gameplay a lot of you know games as a service they do this sort of stuff right they really emphasize um they emphasize uh emergent gameplay thank you for the uh, follow cow 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 thank you for the follow games as a service uh typically uh emphasize emergent gameplay right uh letting players use their creativity with the mechanics that are given to them to make a unique experience for other players and and we've seen that in mmos especially the early mmos very much the case but thank you cow 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 for the follow how are you doing tonight by the way i hope that you are loving the cows that the cows are an integral part of your existence because cows are fantastic <laughs> but old mmos um really emphasized emergent gameplay in a great way by in that living world experience and everquest does a really great job of <clears throat> providing a a structure or a more defined structure than a lot of um other earlier mmos like stuff like Ultima Online and Meridian 59 and um, Underlight and Star Wars Galaxies. Well, those things were all fantastic games. They didn't have a structure for uh, a narrative structure, right? And they really emphasized far more than anything, the players driving the narrative and kind of creating that story amongst each other. EverQuest has a great balance of allowing for that emergent gameplay, but also providing that structure for people to be able to play uh and and experience stories not these epic grandiose stories of you being the chosen one to save the world but instead an adventurer in a world of adventure um and experiencing very smaller scale or intimate and more realistic style stories um it's just fantastic 
we've been seeing emergent gameplay in Animal Crossing now. Yes, Audio Eric, indeed. It's good to have you, Audio Eric. I hope you're doing well, my friend. Um, the thing is that emergent gameplay, I think, is super important. And I find it so interesting, and I've, I've talked about this before on stream, and I'm uh, forgive me for sounding like a broken record sometimes, but one of the things that Emergent Gameplay is super important for, it allows for the creative and um, those really active players, those ones who like to actively engage in creating those experiences, to then entertain and engage with those players who like to passively experience that stuff. They don't want to... Um, create those stories, those bits. They don't want to go out there and host the funeral service for a decaying corpse or, you know, uh, getting money off of people to consult a spinning tree. Instead, they want to be the person who's like brought into that by those people so that they don't have to do the work. They get to experience that emergent gameplay and enjoy it without having that stuff. And I think EverQuest does a great job at, at allowing that to happen. I think it's super important in these sorts of things, in the... Um, in the structure of online gaming, that having that that element of active engagement in emergent gameplay and that passive engagement is super important. A lot of people see that stuff and they become like very intimidated, being like, "I don't want to do that." They look at like the the stuff that people create and stuff like Minecraft or Animal Crossing and that sort of thing, and they're like. Yeah, but I don't want to do that or spend the time doing that. They don't realize that they don't have to. That they could just, like, download a map and explore it and then discover the work that these other people have done and, and to digest it in a different way, in a more passive way, instead of having to work on the building process of it. Hesh says, I, it can't just be a buzzword either, though. New World and No Man's Sky promised emergent gameplay, but just delivered sterile worlds with no depth. Well, No Man's Sky's a little different. I will say that New World is kind of, Hesh's, yeah, they, they've made some mistakes. No Man's Sky's a little bit different. Um, I, although I wouldn't say that they have emergent gameplay. I, w uh, I would absolutely say that they have non-sterile worlds and they have depth. I will say this. There's a lot of depth to No Man's Sky in terms of its actual story. It's just presented in a very different way. But emerging gameplay, not so much. You can a bit with players and the discovery of what people have built. But that stuff isn't the major crux. It isn't the major emphasis in that game. If that makes any sense. Nick says, tired, getting toward the end of the t term. Working to get students to finally submit stuff. Yeah, Nick, I'm so sorry, my friend. That's why we're not doing... Interactive Story Saturday tonight. Nick is working too hard as a teacher. Although we will be recording the podcast. Uh, and Nick, I, I want to make you incredibly anxious. I'm a third of the way done with the book that we were recording tomorrow. <laughs> I've read it twice already, Nick. So this is my third time reading. It's difficult for me to do. I'm speed reading it slowly and surely, but there's certain points in the book. Uh, we're, so our next episode in the Literate Pixel podcast that we do, a uh, podcast based off of books, based off of video games. Um, the first book, of course, being an EverQuest book, Rogue's Hour. Um, yeah, Nick, but I want to get the I want to get the intricacy. So I'm bookmarking my favorite quotes and moments in the book to be able to kind of highlight certain things. I have, still have so much to say, but I want to get that refresher still. Um, I'm going to reread it to its completion for sure for recording tomorrow. We're reading um, the book of Atris, which is based on the Mist franchise, and very much how um, the the Mist novelizations are uh, a major segue into Mist Online. That uh, a lot of people don't realize this. They're like, oh, because the book of Atris takes place uh, where the main character okay store that carapace in the bank i will spoil where the quest is at i won't spoil but once you do find it this is probably the hardest part to solo i will absolutely bank it thank you so much it is legitimately amazing that you are taking the time to help me um missed online for a lot that don't know um that there's a missed MMO, which is a weird thing to say. 
missed this adventure game about you know seclusion and solitary existence in this crazy world of potential um is there's an mmo and it's a fantastic game it's one of my all-time favorite games it is brilliant and beautiful and filled with world building and the book of atris takes place where atris is um one of the like the main protagonists in the game series that you you work with he's a person who writes books he's the father of the two two brothers who you meet in the first mist game um it's when he's a child and growing up yeah atm machine the book of ages is a novelization um and it's a novelization of Atrus when he's a kid, how he his his father had left him when he was a, a newborn baby, and he was raised by his grandmother, and um, how his father comes back and takes him under his wing, and his father is the antagonist in Riven, the sequel to Mist. So people are like, oh, so the story is really kind of just a lead up to give you info on Riven, and I'm like, there is so much about it that is a lead up into mist online there is so much information and content and details that really highlight very particular facets of the world of mist online um and it even has illustrations that are very much a part of what mist online is about key how's it going key botanist <laughs> key how are you doing my friend so bobin's getting down yeah, Key, what's happening right now is we're playing EverQuest. This delightful person, uh, the Ixar with a really crazy mask, um, is Modwolf in the chat. They're helping me. They're taking me to a place that is very much above my level. I should not be here. But they are helping me acquire a mask. I am a Wood Elf Bard. They are helping me acquire a mask that will allow me to take the shape and form of a dark elf and get access to all the evil cities in the world even though i'm a good race and good race in quotes um so that way i can get access to like far more portions of the world without having to make an evil character with the hopes of gaining reputation with them posing as evil so that way when i do become good and take that mask off they will accept me as one of their own <laughs> excuse me how are you doing tonight, Key? Key, did you, did you, uh, did you did buy Monster Rancher? <laughs> I was talking to my good friend Key about Monster Rancher and our experiences with it and why it is such a fantastic game um, and why it was one that I absolutely adored. Oh, yeah. At some point, Key, I mean, like, look, your monsters can die. You absolutely, oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to fall over. Uh your monsters can die and it is heartbreaking but what's amazing about it is that the game comes from the perspective of like you should you, you should say something like you should remember this this is important and it's, it's so funny to see that experience in a game because typically they don't do that but this game very much emphasizes being empathetic Audio Eric says, no complaints here. So far, we're still planning to be in person. My course load is heavier this semester, but it should be fun. Fingers crossed. Everyone stay safe. Audio Eric, I'm rooting for you. I hope everything goes okay. How's the game going, by the way, Audio Eric? I hope it's going well. Um, But yeah, key. Oh, I knew immediately that it was a you kind of game, and I had to see what the the death experience was in in Monster Rancher. Before I could be like, Key, this game is amazing. We need to talk about this. Because I wanted to know if it was a place of reverence or if it was a, eh, whatever. You know, like a dismissive, not like callous thing. And it definitely is a place of reverence. And it's like, it doesn't, it, it can be a sad thing of loss and, and, and remorse, but it doesn't have to be a uh, traumatic or or bad experience, you know, emotionally bad experience. It was wild. It was wild that they're like, they even ask you, do you want to have a funeral service? You can say no and be dismissive and because they allow a person to be a bad trainer. 
I don't like that, but um, but then you're like, yes, and they have one. It's so it's so wild, and they're all co- people come in that you've you've met, and they all talk about your monster that you've raised, and they uh, and the tombstone it does a scroll of its life, the things that it accomplished, the things that it had done, and then uh, yeah, and that stays on your ranch, which is just crazy for me to to think because no game really treated it that way imagine in a you know a pokemon game if that was a thing yeah you know i can't even imagine it Uh, but key i'm glad you're doing well i'm doing okay i'm doing okay uh like it's weird i have been man seasonal depression gets to me it's been super cold and super gray here in michigan and it's funny because I was thinking about this because our first game of the year for the last two years running, and I think maybe all of my life and when I stream, I never thought about it. But for the the first game of the year, for two years running, I don't finish. It's Monster Rancher and Unreal. And I think it's just like I get really, um, I get really disconnected. You know, I get like very much like, it's not like there's something weird going on in my brain chemistry where I'm like, no, I can't finish this. I have to move on. Nick says that might happen in the PETA version of Pokemon. Maybe, maybe Nick. Um, and it's so weird. It's, it's such a weird feeling. I never really thought about it. And Monster Rancher was a game that I love. I will continue to play that game. But it was the very first time where I was like, I can't stream this anymore. Like, I, I can't. It was a weird feeling that it was like a game that I really enjoyed. Unreal was easy for me to, to drop. It's like, I'm not having fun with this. It's just really drawing itself out. You know, I've gotten through like three-fourths of this game, but I was like done a long time ago, and it should have ended back then, and it wasn't. Yeah, Key, I feel you there. Um, poop place over again. I don't want to hold the stream too much. Wormney, you're not... Dude... Model, if you don't need to worry in the slightest, I can talk on without end. We're doing just fine. We're doing just fine. Hi, everyone. Whenever you stream, you will always be somewhat worried about the audience. You need to have your dedicated personal time with certain games to truly feel them in your heart. Yes, Keycliff. And I had felt them in my heart. See, I don't have too much that that uh, immersion without distraction. I can easily. I'm killing five names, so we might get there. Yes, some loot too. Nice. No worries. Take your time, Mud Wolf. Take your time. Um, I don't have much of a problem with the connection side of things, but what happens is there's definitely a moment where in Monster Rancher, we had gone through two monsters. We had retired them. They were encased in ice. Um, I got to S rank, but I couldn't beat the S rank before they would pass away, so I wanted to keep them alive and keep them encased in, in like cryogenically freeze them. Uh, and then we got our third monster, which was like a special unlockable one. But I was like, I don't, I don't want to subject them to the same stuff that they've already seen, you know, the people in chat. So I was like, I'll, I'll do this on my own. Like there wasn't more for them to see at that point. If I get past the S rank or get strong enough where I think I'll be able to do so, I might bring it back up again. Uh, but I was like, I don't want to subject them to the same stuff. Um, you know, because it's like, we, we've seen this already. There's not much more to discover in that regard. I think that's kind of been the major driving force for me in streaming games. And it's one of the lessons that I'm starting to learn <clears throat> early on this year is that, like, it's okay to say no to a game if it's not showing something or bringing up something that's interesting, um, you know? And that was one of those cases there. There wasn't a story to drive us more, uh, to, to enlighten us or more pieces of a puzzle that we were getting access to. Um, there wasn't more uh, knowledge being gained or things to, to see uh, at that point. So Kanako says, Biggest Matt Folktory. I'm Biggest Matt Folktory. Would you like to hear a song? It's a folk song, everybody. Get ready. Oh, in Lower Gok, there was a wood elf. Do, 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 do. And he 
had delved in with his Ixaw friend. Do, 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 do. And when they finally reached the destination, they found do, 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 a mask that turned them to a dark elf. Boom, 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 boom. I can't sing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Invoking Paul Simon, indeed. I don't know actually what the so sound of Paul Simon is, but yes. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Um, so yeah, it just, it was weird. It was interesting, uh, playing Monster Rancher and being like, that one I'm going to play on my own. Like my daughter loves it. She's, you know, my six-year-old daughter, uh, Roz, she loves that Monster Rancher a bunch. That's a game I can play with her and we can experience this stuff together. We've discovered some really cool stuff. We had a lot of fun. We had this story and narrative that was interesting. Um, and that was really important to have. But it was time to move on, stream-wise at least. And um, we'll, I'll play that more. You might see it again on stream, without question. Monster Rancher 2 will also definitely be a thing. Maybe next year at some point we'll probably try Monster Rancher 2. Because it comes with both packed in. Um, but yeah, our schedule is going to be really different. Um, <clears throat> after next week, we will be... Monday will be... EverQuest Day. That's the day we play EverQuest. Mondays will be MMO Mondays. MMO Mondays! And then uh, Wednesday and Friday, we'll be playing uh, single-player games. And then Saturday, I play Infocom games with my dear and beloved friend, Nick. Nick, I love you. My best... My, my real-world bestie. <clears throat> and, uh... I think that's a good balance. Um... I was one of those things where I felt like, uh, I always have this problem and it happened early with our podcast that we do, um, that I very much love like powering through stuff. So I'm like one game, four days a week, like all my streams will be just one game until I beat it, you know? Um, and for some people that's not very engaging, and that was the same thing with the podcast. Where I was like, we'll just do all the Zork books. <laughs> it's like, some people would like some diversity. And I'm like, you know what? I think that's actually probably very true. And I was realizing in my brain, too, that with some games, if I were to do them four days a week, I would easily burn out. Or I just wouldn't be interested in playing the game anymore. Uh, and having that diversity is going to help me get through them. Because like we're going through Shining the Holy Ark. We started that up just yesterday. And uh, that is a very interesting dungeon-crawling Japanese RPG on the Sega Saturn. And then, but yeah, key, the obligation of having to play it on every stream in a row, it's starting to happen. Like that fatigue is starting to happen to me. A time machine shining, shining the holy ark. It's true. That's how it is on the box art. Um, and I'm really enjoying the game. But if I were to be that, have that be like every stream, I would probably be bored. Doing this is exciting because I can talk about MMOs, and like that's the thing I love to talk about the most. Um. Oh man, key, key. Oh, I know you're not necessarily interested in this. Uh, but there is a game that I learned about MMOs the m, -m most <laughs> It's going to be m, m mondays Um, I, I was brought to light by my good friend Sakura, as well as Mike, um, uh, wonderful friends of, of the stream, and Sakura, my dear friend, who's moderator of the channel. Um, they, uh talked about this MMO that I learned about, which I had never heard of, called, um... Uh, ha, 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 the World... Uh, Earth and Beyond is what it's called. 2002, published by EA, and it is a, a, a space MMO that is all about 
Flying Your Ship, Earth and Beyond, Westwood Studios. Yes, published by EA, developed by Westwood Studios. And you go to, like, space stations, and um, and you talk to NPCs and get quests, and that's, like, the social side of things is in these space stations all across the galaxy. And there are... And you go around flying, doing missions, gathering resources from asteroids, very much like a uh, if... If No Man's Sky didn't let you land on planets, and it was all the space stuff and space station stuff, and was designed like an old, early 2000s, late 1990s MMO, and I love it. I remember when Earth and Beyond was coming out, I was in the beta test for it. Interesting Kuno no Oni. When I, um, you can fly into atmosphere though. Oh, you can, Sakura? Ooh, I didn't, I don't know. I'm still in, again. Listen, listen. I love MMOs. I love reading about MMOs. Never in my life have I ever gotten to late game content in an MMO. Never. Never in my entire life. Uh, that's not true. Matrix Online I did. Um, MMOs Factory. <laughs> MMOs are so interesting though. And 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 key. Oh, oh, key, key, key. We're making some progress on the mud um they're so interesting sakura's like yes they really are i'm so glad sakura that you agree with me on this um they're so fascinating because it's not just it's not just uh looking at game design don't forget about runes of magic that i told you yes kunononi i have it here it's on my it's on my paper my don't forget paper um so uh, what makes MMOs so fascinating, so interesting, is that it's not just about game design. It's not about the mechanics entirely. It's not just about uh, the fun of the game. It is about this world building, and it's more than this. It's so much more about the psychology of things, how players play this game, how players develop a culture around this game, and what's so fascinating um, sorry, Audio X says, have you heard about the pandemic that happened in WoW? That's a fascinating story. Absolutely. Where they introduced a virus that could spread to other people, and then it, it just went everywhere? Yes. That's so interesting. <clears throat> they need more of that in, in, in games in general. This is um, a situation that I think is uh, so important in games that I don't think that most modern game MMOs don't do. Um is that uh, you can't make it perfect. You shouldn't even make it balanced. You should make it interesting. You should just allow people to kind of shape how things are going to be. And I think what would make it very interesting is that they see these sorts of things and then begin to start catering to them. Walrus is not like the Pokerus, apparently. No key. Scientists have studied that plague to understand how viruses spread. It's true. It's very interesting. Um, it's not like a real virus key, but like a like a, a one that was actually made just to, to mess with the player base. It was a a thing in the game. It was it was developed to be this way. Yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's just it's fascinating to see how these things shape and change. And I think that it's so important for us to be able to study MMOs, not just on a level of like, how to make an MMO better. Well, Eric says, in fact, it was intended for a boss, I think. Someone dragged a world boss into one of the cities. It wasn't meant to get out. Interesting. I didn't even realize that, Sakura. That's fascinating. That's awesome. Uh, but this stuff tells you also, uh, this tells you also so much information about people and how we work in society and how societies work. They are, uh, literally a, a self-encapsulated society, culture, how we behave, how these things can be regulated and defined, how we can, how, uh, how the the citizens within a society define the culture, not the people who run, you know, the, the system of government, that sort of stuff. 
Kunano Oni says, It was a dot damage over time that would normally be removed from the player when the fight was over, but the devs forgot to remove it from pets. That's how it spread. Oh, the world boss that was dragged into the city was different. There are so many different things. Um, and so you learn about how people abuse systems for their own personal gain. And that's very much a thing that happens in society and the real world today. Um, and you could learn how to address that stuff using MMOs. How do you make a world where you can encourage people to not abuse to a great degree these flaws? And what can happen to people who do? What things can they abuse? What systems they can they abuse? How can those things be, um, you know, channeled into something more productive? Kuduno only says, that is funny, Marwolf. I never heard that one. Which world boss was it, if you remember? Yeah, I'm intrigued. Because there, there was one that was like a holiday plague, wasn't there? That they did, just for fun? I feel like they have a lot of fun with plagues. But MMOs have this ability to teach you so much about people, to teach you so much about how we interact with each other, and how they're reflective of modern culture and how we can change that stuff, how we can alter people's perspectives on things to make them more productive. Night Rider busting in nine months. How's it going, Night Rider? Thank you, my friends. Mm. Ah! Dude, Knight Rider, we're just hanging out here quietly in Lower Guck. You know, a good place for a level 15 Wood Elf bar to hang out in. Um, Just having a good old time. Oh, jeez, someone fix that. <laughs> Lazy Lion's dead, how's it going? Don't worry, Mod Wolf, we'll get it fixed. Sakura, save the day! Even I could probably do it, though. Permit Mod Wolf. Is that right? Nope. Oh, permit Mod Wolf. Thank you, Sakura. Thank you. As always, a gentle person and scholar. Lynx. What could possibly go wrong? I know, right? That's exactly it, Knight Rider. How could it possibly go wrong? We are uh, waiting to get a Dark Elf mask. And we're just talking MMOs right now. We scared everybody off with that tingle dance. Everybody ran away and hid. <laughs> no worries, Key. We'll be here. Um. So, yeah. I just... Look, MMOs are so fascinating. And they're so beautiful and so wonderful. Because they are meticulously crafted. But they are not meticulously balanced. They're not refined to a point of sterility. Especially these older ones. These sorts of things can make things just be a truly magical and engaging experience. It's beautiful. People should play them. People should revel in them. They are so good. They're so interesting. It's not a thing that you have to be obsessed with. What happens is that people get into this idea of the social obligation of an MMO. You don't have to be defined by this and I think that you can look at a lot of the older MMOs and look at how things are in what weapons are you using oh uh fine steel rapier currently yes um you can look at uh these older games like EverQuest and things like this and you can see that it's not as much of a rush. For some small niche communities in these MMOs, they're rushing to get to max level. A lot of MMOs in modern day are built around end game content. They're encouraging people to rush through things and enhancing the social obligation that you as a player must dedicate a lot of time in large chunks to play and experience this game properly. Um, and that's not... How you should be playing. I mean, there's no wrong way to play an MMO. But that's not the only way. 
I have many of these hammers I get from Wars and Velius. They only been for five copper, so I save them for pets and new players. Ooh. Too kind. Too kind, my friend. Let's see. What's this guy got? Velium Warmall. I can... Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Okay. I will happily equip that Warhammer. That is very helpful. <laughs> I'll happily take it. I'm dying for help. It looks cool, too. Let me see. Oh. Give me a lucky. Oh, dude, that looks great. That looks fantastic. Um, and so with an MMO, uh, I never understood why that weapon isn't magic. It's a great question, Lizzie Lyons, then. Luckily, I mean, my thing wasn't magic, so it's not like it's a downgrade in that regard, at least. I don't have a magical weapon yet. Um, a champion champ bouncing up and down because a spell has been cast on me that is a levitate spell. So I'm actually hovering a little bit off the ground right now. That's kind of what's going on there. Um, and it's uh, prim only. I'd love to use two on my monk. Oh, it's primary only. Excuse me. So here's the thing. Why I think that it's worth giving a shot to play MMORPGs. Why I think that these are interesting and engaging. And while you may have been sitting and watching me for like the last 20 or 30 minutes, sitting in this one spot, waiting for something to spawn, that's because I want something very particular. And I'm getting help getting it because it's a situation where I shouldn't be here. But it's something that why I can sit here and talk to you for hours on end about MMOs and why I think they're special. It's because when I approach these sorts of games, uh... In sort of fashion quest, it's a solid 8.5. I like it, Lazy Lion's Den. When I get into fashion quest, Lazy Lion's Den, we're absolutely going to spend time ranking uh, <laughs> ranking items. <laughs> ranking uh, the best uh, armor on the different races. How it looks on the different races. Which one's the best? Um, when we do start doing Mama Mondays, uh, we will be ranking the faces of all the races individually, like once a week. This is all the human races. Let's see which ones have the best face and rank them one to, uh, you know, one to 10. Uh, but why you should play MMOs, why anybody can get into an MMO and start playing them. You don't need uh, to fit into this social obligation. You don't have to play catch up. Uh, there's a, a world of having dedicated characters. You have a character that you play with friends or you play by yourself that you all have the agreement of. We only play with these characters together. You almost said butts. <laughs> Shut up, Nick. Um, you only play those with your friends. Uh, you don't play them outside of that. So that way you treat it as a co-op game experience. Then you're playing with just one or two other friends going into play. People always like to talk about, hey, uh, playing Fortnite or playing something like Halo Call of Duty, you play with your group of three or four friends, uh, go in for a couple hours and do some matches. You can do that with MMOs and people don't realize that that's the case. They don't feel like that's a thing for them or that's a, uh, a possibility. But they also feel like everything has to be a grind, that everything is this, this experience that I am doing right at this moment. And for most people who have watched me play through this game so far, that's been far from the case. Uh, I've done that with a character on Star Wars The Old Republic. Had one person play each class. Exactly, Sakura. Um, with... This is a very weird exception to the rule because we're looking for something very particular. Um, but typically when you play something like EverQuest, you don't have to sit there and do the same thing over and over again ad nauseum. A lot of people like to just like grind a particular camp because it's just easy for them at that moment to do that. You don't have to. You can move around and experience a whole variety of different mobs and different quest lines and stories that you can experience, which is really interesting, and, and discover new things by exploration, because this game does a great job of rewarding exploration and discovery. Um, but MMOs in general are just fascinating worlds to exist in, to explore, to, uh, to interact with other people, and there is this major stigma with video games now I think wholeheartedly that any interaction with another person in a video game is going to invariably lead to a toxic encounter. You're going to 
be talking to a person who is a horrible human being. That's just what is going to happen. This, this belief that this is what will happen. And that's really not the case. Most of the time, the people that you're going to experience and come across in an online game of any sort are typically people who are just excited to want to play. They're just as scared about meeting a toxic person as you are. It's one of those situations where you're both trying to cross uh, a hallway and you're moving in front of each other and then you're like, oh, step to the side and they step at the same side as you. No one's willing to like, you know, be the first one to say hi in that situation. Model says, that is why I can't play WoW anymore. When you level, you always follow the same quest paths. Grinding on mobs is obscenely slow. Modwolf, 100%, which is why I think that this design uh, aspect of EverQuest is why it's so interesting. The, the path from 0 to 50 is dramatically different based on what class you're playing, what race you're playing, and just where you are in the map. It's so vibrant and diverse uh the mmos are worth experiencing and playing they don't have to be a grind uh with the book that i read for the literate pixel podcast the rogues hour it has a forward by r.a salvatore who talks about his experience in everquest and he talks about the beauties of this game and why it's worth people's time and one of the things that he very much stresses that like the experience up to level 30 is incredibly magical and there's a certain point after this that it can become a bit of a slog because you may have seen everything there is to see at that point and while i do disagree in this instance there is so much more to see based on what kind of character you are what town you're in and that sort of thing um things do start to filter into more specific zones and things like this but um there is this magic in in characters at those points and that's a lot of content there's so much content in this game there's so much content in so many mmos um and that's why it, it's really interesting right we talk about like the the old vanilla servers and stuff like this some old mmos it's interesting as to why everquest is one of those ones that has a, a very incredibly active user base and it's because of it's I, I talked about this earlier about this perfect balance of um the the structure at quests that NPCs give you and and but as well as player interactivity and the active player creating content for the passive players that sort of stuff but it's a perfect balance for it so, for instance, like if you play a classic server of Ultima Online, you're not getting a full experience unless there's an incredibly active user base. Because it's the scales are tilted dramatically for active players creating content for passive players versus having there's not a lot of like uh, built in content for players to experience. There's a lot of reliance on everybody else in a way that kind of blockades you from getting the full experience of the game and so if you want to play a real like traditional ultima online experience you need to have players and typically the more popular ultima online servers are stuff like um uh is it, what is it renaissance it's not renaissance renaissance is the the classic one there's a whole bunch of them that are player created content and like very changed and altered Earl, have a wonderful night. It is, as always, a pleasure, Earl. Let's sound you off with the trumpet, right? <laughs> For you, Earl. So, yeah, when you have something like Ultima Online, um, there's a lot of uh, player bases moved on to stuff that's custom content and that sort of stuff. So you don't get the, the true uh, original experience because the major player base is moved on to something else. They don't stay around for that stuff because there's not enough. There's not enough for them to stay because for them, they've already kind of seen it and done it, you know, for the more experienced players here in EverQuest, there is just such a, a wellspring of content that there's a lot of people that have never seen or experienced, you know, they can get to their max level and not even see half the game. 
you you almost indefinitely are. Whoa. I just turned on my phone tile alert with my butt. <laughs> Hold on. I have a a thing that helps me find my wallet and keys because I can't find anything in my life, as well as invertibly invertedly can take this the thing that's in my wallet or my keys and find my phone. And I just did that with my butt. Um A Tim Machine, we're waiting for <clears throat> an NPC to spawn that has this mask. They're actually here. Like they they've been spawning. I'm waiting because this is a safe place for me. If I move I'm going to die. Uh and it has a chance of dropping this mask. That's what's happening. And like I know this isn't the most thrilling and enthralling thing. I know this is not making a great case to play a request right now. Luckily, this was not my... So this was like a perfect time. Um, did I locate my butt? I, well, I located my phone within which my butt notified me about the location of my phone. It wasn't the other way around. I'd have to go on my phone and be like, where's my butt? And then it would tell me. Um, so ATM Machine, yeah, what we're doing right now is looking for a very particular item. It's not necessarily the most indicative of my gameplay experience, but I wasn't planning to play this tonight. I was supposed to be playing Infidel with Nick, but no, he has to be a responsible adult and be, you know, a teacher to the youth of America. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. And, um, but yeah, so we're just going to do this one. This is a perfect time for just chilling and talking because like man i just love talking games it stinks sometimes too because like being an adult sucks, sucks sometimes it does audio eric it does <laughs> but that's that's okay that's life it happens i love talking about games i love talking about game design i love talking about just everything audio eric when, like, there is nothing more exciting for me when somebody says or talks about a game and someone chimes in and is like, I love that game. Or vice versa. If someone's talking about a game and another person's like, I don't know what that is. Like, tell me about this game. To me, that is the biggest thing. To me, that's the most exciting thing. I love when people enthuse about this stuff. I love when people recognize that. You know, they, they talk about, like, nostalgia being a driving factor in, like, people's endorphins and being like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh. For me, it's not like, hey, guys, remember Mario 3? It's like, hey, guys, do you remember the Hercules text, uh, text MMO. And people would be like, what? <laughs> hey, do you remember this incredibly obscure and weird game? And there's one person who's like, I love that game. That is like my favorite game of all time. And I'm like, yes! 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 <laughs> we did it. We did it. We found that guy. Because there's always that guy. It's like in Pokemon. There's always that one person who loves that Pokemon. There's not a single Pokemon that exists that doesn't have a number one fan. And while you're like, that is a terrible Pokemon. I do not like that Pokemon. I think it's uninteresting. I think it's gross. I think it's weird. There's a person who's like, that's my favorite Pokemon ever made. Did you say Hercules MMO text adventure? Kunononi? Absolutely I did. It's called Hercules. Um, it is, uh, yeah, it was a uh, Hercules. It was called, it was a mud. Around the time of like Gemstone 3. I believe it was Gemstone 3 at the time. Um, so here's the thing, Kurunoni. I played a tiny fraction of it as a kid. This would have been at my early days of MMOs. Because um, we didn't have access to uh, high-speed internet at the time. So this would have been... I don't know if... I used this gaming service called MPlayer. Uh, it allowed us to play... We learned about it because we had Battlespire. Uh, the Elder Scrolls Battlespire, and its multiplayer co-op and deathmatch modes were uh, done through M-Player, which, another quick aside, if people like to think that 
having exclusive platforms for games is a new thing? They have never been around in the late 90s or th th and back. The internet and that world was all about exclusive platforms for games and the the stuff with all of that. Like, it's wild. Um, and Psyduck and Squirtle are my favorite Pokemon. It's Kuno no Oni. Psyduck is my favorite Pokemon. I also am a big fan of... Where's my Dunsparce? Where's my Dunsparce? I have children. Oh, here he is. My Dunsparce. Also a big fan of Dunsparce. I'm going to lose Sully from Monsters, Inc. on Disney Infinity. I love me some Dunsparce as well. Kuno no Oni, like, never winter nights on AOL. Gone. Lost to time. Um, and as well as the Dark Sun MMO. I don't know if you've ever done that one. There was a Dark Sun MMO that ran on the same engine as Dark Sun Shattered Lands and Mike of the Ravager. Audio Eric, thank you. Have a wonderful night. And, and oh, Audio Eric, I'd love to talk about Earth and Beyond with you. Very much so. It's a pleasure. I know it's not exciting. I'm just sitting here talking games. So anyways, sorry. So I got into M Player. Um, and... Uh... It uh, was wild. Um, M Player was, yeah, this game service thing, you know, something like uh, Game Tap and and AOL and that sort of thing at the time. And um, I think Hercules was on there or Gemstone. I don't because I was playing Underlight. That's how I got introduced to Underlight as my MMO that I played. I love Underlight very much so, and it's one I have to stream at some point. It's on. You can get it on Steam. It's free. It's worth playing. It's a wild MMO game. It's whew, nothing is like it. Um, and but uh, it was a text one. I didn't get to play much of it. I was still young at the time. Uh, I played a little bit more of Gemstone Three, but it was uh, set in the world of Hercules. Yeah, in Greek mythology and all that jazz. It was a uh, really cool. You can. I think it's still around. Let me let me take a look. I'll take a look while we wait. Hercules mud. Oh, game. No, none of this. Text MMO. Must include Hercules. Wow, is it? Is this? Whoa, there we go. Did anyone else play the Xeno slash Hercules text advent, uh, based online mud? 1999, that would have been around the time that I learned about it. Game made by Simutronics. Alliance of Heroes is not. Hold on. Let's see. Hercules Simutronics. Okay, it's just known. It's known as Alliance of Heroes now. So if you want to actually play it, it's called Alliance of Heroes now. It changed names. And. Oops. Yeah. Yep. Actually, still around. Still around. It's the one. It's called Alliance of the Heroes. Originally titled Hercules and Xena. That's what it was. I would just always thought of it as Hercules. Um, Kuno no Oni. Just so you know, and and by the way, thank you, Audiorg, for just coming in. You don't need to thank me for stringing. I'm just hanging out. Um. Here. Uh. Let me. Oh, it might not be still around. Hold on, let me see. Mud fandom. Let's see. Let me see. Where is the info on the thing? The game is constantly being updated and worked on in an effort to keep it as updated as possible. Let me see. Oh man, okay. Hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. Uh. The 
There's a tabletop game now called Alliance of Heroes. No. It might not be around anymore. It might not be around anymore. It looks like it's gone. Is that emu like under wraps? People had to be invited through a friend of a friend type hush hush all sneaky sneaky. Oh, that I don't know. Interesting. Someone decided to leak everything, essentially making it public. For what thing, Lazy Lions, then? For which uh, emulator stuff? Sorry, did I totally miss that conversation? No, I did not. Um, for which game? Oh, City Heroes. Yeah. No, this wouldn't be. Alliance of Heroes is a text-based Xena Hercules uh, mud that was a commercial release back in the uh, mid to late 90s. It's one that I played way back in the day. I don't have many memories of it, though, to be honest. Muds are always a very uh, unusual thing. Um, but yeah, Alliance of Heroes is what... Uh, think, look up Xena Hercules Alliance of Heroes. Kuno no Oni. It's worth taking a look at. Um, muds are really interesting. If I didn't have P99, I'd be on the City of Heroes private server. Mod Wolf... I'm going to, uh, Modwolf, at some point, I will be doing City of Heroes to play. And you're more than welcome to come and join and play if you ever want to play. We'll get there. We'll get there someday. I'm probably, once I kind of get a lot of EverQuest out of my system, which is going to be a long time, but, uh, and not one that will ever fully be out of my system, ever. Uh, because MMO Mondays, MMO Mondays, Mondays will be about a lot of stuff. Homecoming's fun. I have multiple characters on the server. City of Heroes just screams role play. And that's what I love. Um I will probably the next one I'm gonna do is probably Earth and Beyond, because I really want to see it. And I might spend some time Oh, there's so many, so many MMOs. Okay, I want to show Underlight to folks. Nobody knows what Underlight is. There's fun open world bosses, the whole server gets together to defeat. Awesome, Mud Wolf. I see I played some. Again, listen. As a kid, so I had a much older brother. My oldest brother, Nate, he um, he had a big disposable income. He loved MMOs. He'd buy, like, every one that ever existed. But I never got to have permanent characters. So I always got to have, like, a taste of all these different games and all these different worlds. And I never got to delve deep into them. And now there's this major desire to want to do so. I mean, as an adult, I and I, I love the genre. Uh, when I was able to actually finally have a disposable income of my own, spending a lot of time in these games that I very much enjoyed, but I never got super far into a lot of games. So like something like even Underlight, the one I played, um, I never got super far because I spent far much more time role playing and, um, and being this very unique style of play for that character, for that game. Because uh, you could have progression being a pacifist and not engaging in combat at all and being able to be able to progress in that game, which is really interesting. Um, and that's what I dedicate my time doing. And like getting a, a point where you get uh, a title and rank in this game uh, called Wordsmith. And that's really just being a person who is very good at role playing. <laughs> and so the character creation for city heroes is the best. Yeah. So what I did mud wolf, um, it, it, no joke at the time when city heroes came out and I got to play it, uh, my favorite, uh, I know this is so dumb, please like, please do not judge me. My favorite Marvel superhero was Guido from, uh, X factor. I just thought he looked really, really cool. He does not. Um, and so I made him. And I made him, like, really a, a very accurate portrayal of him. And I loved it. It's fantastic. Um, so I definitely want to revisit City Heroes and, like, actually know what's happening. Because I just made spent time with character creator and, like, I never really played the game. You know? I feel like I do... I feel like... The games I love the most are the games that I'm also, like, not very good at. <laughs> Time run later, John. Have you read the other book? I just got it in the mail. Uh, wait, which other book, Nick? The Doom one? 
I sent you a... You didn't have to buy it. I sent you a PDF of it. I have not, because I have to read this one first, Nick, but I'll be reading it soon. I let them know that, that um, our timeline, Nick, for the next book, uh, and uh, we have time. We'll be fine. Lazy Lions then says, I had an absolute blast <clears throat> reliving, da reliving Daggerfall created with Unity. That's high on my list. Highly recommend anyone to enjoy the original and never finished it to look into it. Lazy Lions then, it's on my list. A hundred percent. What was really nice was uh, uh, when I streamed some Daggerfall because I was like, I'm hellbent on beating this game. And this would have been <sighs> like four five years ago when i had like nobody coming into my streams and like the only person who came in to watch it was the guy who speed runs uh daggerfall <laughs> and he was like just talking to me and i'm just like i have no idea what i'm doing like i have the game as a kid i own the game the cd i have the actual the unofficial prima guide for it which is great read it's very interesting um and, uh, Nick, you say you still have feelers out for bases loaded too? Why? Why do you want to own bases loaded too? That's like the most expensive book of the Worlds of Power series. Don't do it, Nick. Uh, and so Daggerfall is what I wanted to do, but then like I just petered out because also, um, I was just like, I don't know. I just, I didn't have any like drive to to finish it and so i was just like ah, other things came up just had to stop uh but daggerfall is definitely on my list i want to play this year on my list to play this year are uh two other school games that i want to be which are battle spire i want to do an online co-op run through of that game and uh go through redguard the weird third person adventure game action adventure game um both games that I have physical copies for as well. Yeah, Nick, you might get lucky. I think that um, that base of loaded two is so expensive just because it it doesn't pop up very often. Um, and somebody recently got it. All right, yeah. So it's really interesting. The, 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 the stuff that we plan on playing, also really want. Yeah, Kuno no Oni, but uh, we actually, there's a novelization of Bases Loaded 2, the NES baseball game that has no plot. Uh, so back in the uh, early 90s, um, this guy wanted to encourage kids to read, and so he started up a series called the World of Power series, which is novelizations of classic Nintendo games um, to get kids engaged in reading. So, um, Bases Loaded 2 is one of them, Mega Man 2, uh, Ninja Gaiden, uh, Metal Gear. And they are insane. Um, no, it is not an amazing soundtrack. Oh, the Bases Loaded 2 soundtrack is so, ugh. So yeah, it's they're really fascinating to read. Like Mega Man, we did a podcast on Mega Man Two and Bases Loaded Two. Bases Loaded Two is actually not too bad. Um, but Mega Man Two is wild. Uh, the story is that Mega Man, <clears throat> Doctor Light, is like to fight off evil. We need to make another one of you. I built this machine that can clone you. Get on in, and instead of cloning him, it turns him into a real boy. And then Dr. Wily comes in, and so then he has to go through all the stuff, the, the bosses of Mega Man 2, but he is now a mortal. And him experiencing the feelings and emotions. And at the end, once he's won, Dr. Light's like, all right, I'm ready to turn you back into a robot. And he's like, no, I don't want to be back to be a robot. I want to stay human. Because I felt these emotions, and these are great things. And Dr. Light's like, but you were scared, and you had fear, and you're, you know, you feared death. And Mega Man's like, but I also felt joy, and love, and the warmth of the sun, and I'll take that any day. And then he goes and retires in his house. 
it's very sweet. <laughs> it's wild, which is why we do this stupid podcast that we talk about games or books based off of video games. Because a lot of times, so there's a lot of instances where they're really interesting and engaging, like the Book of Atris, which we'll be putting out next week. Um, and there are other instances where they are just good fantasy reads, but not even remotely related to the source material, like the Bard's Tale um, books. And then there's ones that are just god-awful that are just, they boggle your mind how such a thing exists. The Rogue's Hour. EverQuest, The Rogue's Hour. I highly recommend people read R.A. Salvatore Presents, does not write, Presents, EverQuest, The Rogue's Hour by Scott Sianson. It is a terrible book. It is horrifically written. But it is the most mind boggling experience that you will spend so much time going what in the hell were they doing what in the hell were they doing what an XR sex doll they, and they stick in my head Nick <clears throat> ATM machine this is um R.A. Salvatore presents EverQuest, The Rogue's Hour by Scott Sianson. Um, they make... <clears throat> no, Key, the, the book, the novelization of Bases Loaded 2 is worth money, Key. It is great if you hate yourself, says Nick. No, look. Uh, the The... EverQuest novelization of The Rogue's Hour is such a mind-boggling thing. It is like the room. It is a situation where events are happening and you don't understand why. And you're just like, wait, what? Hold on. How did we how did we get here? What is um oh, what? there's a moment where there is a, a moment in the book where a barbarian guy with his wolf companion, he's in the town city of Kinos uh, during a celebration. And uh, they aren't used to civilization and people in a big city. And the barbarian goes into a tavern and the wolf notices another lady wolf. He's a surly guy. He's mad because women uh, use their bodies to manipulate men is this giant anti-woman diatribe it's garbage and so he's like oh there's a lady wolf and then cut to the barbarian who's talking to a barkeep he talks to him for like two pages and then he leaves the, the tavern and the wolf comes back not nearly as surly as he was before but even more so at the very end of the book that tavern, that barkeep, is a crucial character to a plan at the very end of the book. He is like some legendary hero, apparently, that you didn't know was until the very end. He's not in the book at all at any point. He's in the very beginning for like two pages, never spoken of again. At the very end, he appears again to do this major plan to help save the day. And off screen... That plan failed. <laughs> That's it. Invents baseball. Yeah. Uh, no, okay, that's... yeah. <laughs> that's EverQuest, The Rogue's Hour, a book based off of EverQuest. The Bases Loaded 2 book in the Worlds of Power series is actually not bad. It's kind of like a, a more kid-friendly version of... Um, of uh um uh, wow why uh major league the movie major league um and it's it's a done in a journal perspective so it's this character doing a journal <gasps> oh adamantine and Paul, it's, ooh, ooh ooh what are these 
thank you. These look fancy. <gasps> Ooh. Shoulders. Knees and toes. Where's the shoulders in this? Hold on. Where are the shoulders? That's wrists. That's hands. That's wrists. Oh, bam. Haha! -ha! That's fine, though. It's still a better AC thing than my small cloth shawl. I don't have better. I was doing a small cloth shawl. <laughs> Thank you. Um, But no, uh, Bases Loaded 2, it's done in the perspective of one of the players, uh, the catcher of this baseball team, um, that is terrible. The New Jersey Giants. And how they gain confidence to win, and there's a plot... It's not a mask, though, Nick. I know it's true, but that's okay. You don't need to be... Nick, Nick, Nick. I know you're trying to be humorous here, but this person's spending a lot of time trying to help me here. We love them. Um, and so, bases loaded, too. The owner of the team is trying to tank the team intentionally uh, by betting on... Uh, betting against them. And... Uh, the team starts to win and do better. And although the wacky antics and shenanigans that they do to win, and then how they don't need those shenanigans later, the whoopee juice, a whole bunch of things. It's so wild that all of this is still very fresh in my memory. It's an odd experience, but it's actually an enjoyable read. Like, it's for kids. But it's not like... It wasn't bad. I didn't feel like I was wasting my time. Unlike some books, there are some books that I very much felt like I was wasting my time. Oh, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, The Amulet of Power. That book was wasting my time. That was a really, oh, that was so, oh. It's bad. It's not good. It's not a good book. I don't recommend it for anybody. That's one where you listen to people talk about it on a podcast. Don't go read that book yourself. Rogue's Hour on EverQuest, that is a spectacle. That is a madness. That is a fever dream. Hold on. I mean, I've got it. One second. I'm going to read some. That's what we're going to do. Now, I, wanted, I want to stress to you all. That what I'm going to read to you does not have any context. It just happens. Let me see. Okay, so they haven't gotten to the city yet. We have to find this. Um, oh, i got to remember what chapter it's in. We're in the aisle. That's the mermaids who want to have sex with the barbarian. Okay, we're almost there. Blood savers talking about bones. I didn't mean to make this an extra episode of the pot. I, well, I just don't understand, Nick, that... Raj and blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Nonsense. Revelations. All right. This. Okay. I'm gonna. This. The first word is about a character named Magistrale, formerly of Kunark. We have never met Magistrale. He is never alluded to. Uh, and this is a character. The main character, Riley. He has amnesia, and he knows that there is an armor crafter, like a, a special crafter of knives and things like this, on this. Uh, on a random island, not necessarily the one that they're currently on, that may be his dad. That's all we know. And this, uh, Riley does not say like, oh, I'm on that island. I'm going to go find this guy who might be my dad. No, it just opens up like this. Chapter 16, Revelations. Magistrale, formerly of Kunark, strode boldly between isles crammed with the foulest vermin ever to plunder the vast channels of Erin's crossing. They had to be the worst, he decided. 
looking at the way they dressed and taking in their wretched smell. Disgusting. Spare some coin for the Widows and Orphans Fund, asked a pirate, holding out his hat. Matastrale frowned into the man's grimy face. You mean to say if I don't support the efforts of the true men, they won't have the funds to snake even more husbandless wives and fatherless children. Don't be like that, the pirate said with a toothy grin. Free enterprises takes many forms. Ah, but it won't be taking me, Matastrale said as he pushed past the pirate and made sure to check that his money belt was still secure. Hold on. Wait, this magic jolly, the thing's attack. Okay. He kills he kills the, the guy. Woohoo. Um breathing heavily. Magistrally smiled. One would first have to take them from me, the boots. And hope he has boots that have knives in them, yeah. And hope they were the right size. Better to pay for what you want, don't you think? Besides, their magic only works for whoever commissions them, and I'm very selective about the commissions I take on. Magistrally, there you are, called the attractive, if heavy-boned hostess. Come with me, you wily old man. I found exactly what you are looking for. Without another word, Magistrally left the gambling hall and followed the hostess to a small bustling, uh, a hall bustling with visitors. He recognized some of the ne'er-do-wells from previous dealings in recent years and thought abstractly about the shame he might have felt were his son alive to see him in this place, catering to outlaws. Instead, he felt very little, and had to push himself to extremes in every aspect of his life to feel anything at all. She's in here, the hostess promised, as she opened a narrow door and ushered him into a room lit by candles and scented by sandalwood. An Ixar female lounged on a cot near the window, her scaly hide wrapped in a rainbow of silk and accented with a scattering of silver jewelry. That's a lizard lady. Um, precisely what you requested? the host had asked. Excellent, Magistrally told her. He paid her, then rushed her out of the room and slammed the door shut. Fast as the old man's reflexes were, and augmented by spells and armor and weaponry it had taken him a lifetime to design, they were not quick enough to save him. A shadow detached itself from the room's otherwise comfortable depths, threw him up against the wall, and rendered him near senseless in an attack that might have impressed the weaponer, were he not its victim. Riley, the main character, soon had the weaponer bound to a chair. Magistrally's boots were off, the old man's knives, and all manner of concealed weapons that had been on his person had been stripped away and were sitting on the bed next to his life-sized wood carving of an Ixar woman. Riley paid to have it brought here with the winnings he had amassed in the gambling room. At no point in the story has he gone to the gambling room, nor at no point in the story do we ever hear him uh, get a life-size wood carving of an Ixar woman to then draw out a man. I love that I said this, and then like everybody left. <laughs> They're like, nope. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he, he had he had bought a wooden Ixar woman and had paid men to be there to draw a man who wanted to have sex with an Ixar woman and to then find out if he was his dad. It's wild. This whole book is insane. I just, I don't know. Cow, cow, cow. Just like, <laughs> I don't, what? What? It's insane. It's so weird. At no point is he learn that this character is where he is at. That, by the way, is also, I might add, at Irud's Crossing. Irud's Crossing is a single island. Like, there's nothing... No. That's not... There's no gambling dens in Irud's Crossing. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Nick, we were in Irud's Crossing, by the way. We've been there in this game. That's where we were waiting for the boat! The boat! I have scared off so many people by just sitting here talking about games. I'm encumbered! I am encumbered. Oh, it's because of my water that I'm carrying. It's so wild. It's so wild, this book. And there's... Just the dumbest things. The dumbest things. It's the worst. I don't... It's fascinating. It's fascinating. There's a whole... Like... 
the main character, though, uh, I can't even. There are homophobes there. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot going on in that book that is not timely. And uh, I am cucumbered. <laughs> if not sex, but it's. I, may, I forced Nick as part of our uh, a punishment for losing a game in our podcast that he had to make a a fiction a fan fiction set in the world of the rogues hour because rogues hour stands out as a world all its own and uh and so he made a delightful thing about magistrale and his the <laughs> the life he has lived with his XR wooden XR woman. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is not graphic, and it's actually very romantic. They very much love each other, but it is very hilarious. Speaking of which, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe. Oh, oh, Nick, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. My wife signed me out of all of my things. What? I can't sign in right now. I was going to read your your fan fiction. I can't read it. I don't have access to it in my docs. Right now. Because my wife logged me out of all of my stuff. Um... Yeah. Oh man. So yeah, sorry Nick, you don't get to hear your uh your fan fiction read aloud to all the people in chat. Yeah, it's a good time. I love it, man. So uh yeah, for those of who... Ooh, ooh, big deal. For those who, who wanna know, um there's a show that I watch on YouTube. It's fantastic. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. The Found Footage Festival. They are folks that tour the U.S. Um, and the U.K. They uh, they find old VHS tapes uh, of like just wild things and like you know how-to videos. You know, uh, just weird like you know infomercial things, that sort of stuff. They watch them and document all the absurdities of that stuff. It's, it's fantastic. They have a weekly show called VCR Party Live. Uh, it's every Tuesday at 9 p.m. on YouTube. It's really good. It's worth watching. It's hilarious. Hilarious. Um, and I am officially sponsoring that, that particular episode this Tuesday. I'm very excited about it because they're a hilarious show. Like, they put my wife and I through the pandemic. It's insane. Like there is a, um, there's a, there is a, a exercise video that is all about st strengthening. What the? Okay, strengthening one's balls, like and pelvic floor by dangling weights on them, and like there's a real informational video all about that <laughs> it's fantastic or like the weird world of people who did like you know um just weird just home movies and stuff uh, like that are strange and unusual like this guy dancing in a room like with these older women and he is wearing a speedo and a bandit mask and he's just pouring food on himself while all of these old people it's a black room it, there's like nothing and they're sitting in chairs around him and they're just eating like tv dinners and like that is a thing that exists in this world oh i i can't and so it's just wild. It's so much fun. And like these weird, like, you know, anti drug stuff, like for kids back in the day. I mean, okay, I'm going to read Nick's thing. It's called 
Emerald Wood. All right, are you ready? This is an original. Hold on. Did it download? Okay. Oh, my sweet Esmeralda. I can think of few days as perfect as this one, said Madistrale, as he looked out at the sun, just dipping below the horizon. As he sipped a sweet burgundy wine from his silver goblet, which was cool and smooth to the touch, he meditated on the cresting waves just barely visible from the veranda of the palatial seaside estate. As Merolda answered his observation with the same sultry silence that Magistrale had come to love and adore in his partner. It had been a long time since that fateful day when they met. Riley believed it to be a mere ruse, a manipulation to trick an old man into giving long, sought-after answers. Riley could not have anticipated nor understood the decades-long love, aff love affair that he put into motion. For once, Magistrale laid eyes upon her lithe mahogany body, filled with sensuous curves and her scales shimmering in linseed oil. He knew that he could never love another the way that he loved the six arsa Milacrum. With his love and lust frothing to a foam in his heart, neither an attempt on his life nor the ruinous battle devastating the pirate citadel would stop him from the amorous destiny he seized the wooden Xar woman, who thumped with fear as they fled down the tight alleyways and sought refuge in the harbor. Days passed in the sea as Magistrale attempted to row them in a crude dinghy to safety, and although his stomach screamed for sustenance and his body cracked and shrank dry, he had not once before in his life been more elated than he was with the, his Esmeralda on that boat. Once they made it to shore, he dedicated his life to ensuring that he, Esmeralda, and their numerous broods of geckos, which would spring forth from her loins, would have a comfortable future. It was hard work. Navigating his way up Freeport's political ladder, Magistrale's marriage to Esmeralda was never recognized and often openly mocked by the political class. But through sheer will, determination, and shrewd assassination, Magistrale would find himself at the head of Freeport City Council. Just a mere month ago, when he looked at Esmeralda and saw her worn breasts and scales that had long since lost their luster, he knew that in his blind ambition he had let her better years pass by them. It was in that moment that he vowed to retire and spend his days drinking wine, making merry, and rearing their gecko broods that still, despite her old age, were born of her quib so gross, Nick. Nick wrote this, not me. Once the sun finally sat, Magistrale walked over to his love and playfully kissed her on her forehead. Fallen asleep, I see, he said. Let's head to bed, my love, before you get a chill. He lifted his life mate from her lounge and felt like a young man again, for it had been a long time since she felt so light in his arms. As he moved her body toward the bedroom, his hand ran down her back as it had done so many times before, but rather than the aged curves he loved so much, his fingers brushed on something that knotted his stomach with sudden horror. His hand touched the rough and flaky wounds formed of dry rot and a horrible termite infestation. My love! No! Oh. Why did you not tell me that you were ailing so? How long have you been infected by these pernicious parasites? He desperately tried to brush the demons away from Esmeralda, but the more he fought them, the more she crumbled away in his hands. He fell to his knees, unwilling to accept the reality that she would never wake again. And he wept, oh, how he wept! His body convulsed so that the little lizards that brooded betwixt her lower limbs fled in fear of their father. He sobbed until his crying was little more than dry spasms. I did not commission this, Nick. Exhausted, he laid near the body of his love until again he saw the cruel sun cast out its rosy fingers across the sea. It was in the face of that affront by nature and time, for how could the world ever be bright again? Now that its most wonderful denizen had been lost, that Magistrale steeled himself. He placed a long and sensuous kiss on her cold, languid lips, and gently lifted her once more from the bedroom floor. 
His feet ponderously thudded against the marble floors of the veranda as he approached the railing overlooking sea, overlooking the sea. As he walked, his gecko kin fled, knowing the terrible fate that befell their mother and fearing that their father might do what their father might do. He stepped over the railing, careful to not disturb and injure the body of Esmeralda further. None have brought me as much joy as you have, my dear, and I am so sorry that I've squandered it, he choked. A world without you is one that hasn't a place for me. With his eulogy said, he cast himself into the sea, and they were reduced to splinters and pink foam. And this is why to this day, when someone of ambition finds driftwood along the beach at sunset, it is understood as an omen that they neglect that which is truly important. Love. Thank you. That's beautiful, Nick. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You can see such beautiful prose uh, and litanies all throughout our podcast, the Literate Pixel Podcast. Check it out. It's on all major platforms. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Blood Wolf. Great clapping in the game. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Oh, jeez. Basal Gargoyles. Um, that was fantastic, Nick. Thank you for that. That still to this day sits rests deep within my heart as a beautiful beautiful work. All I asked you to do was make a fan fiction, a two-page fan fiction set in the world of the Rogue's Hour slash EverQuest and you took it to places I did not expect. Truly an absolutely divine manifestation of creative genius. Unlike any other. <laughs> it's fantastic I love it so much I love it so much Nick that is one of the great gifts of 2021 we decided to start this stupid podcast and it has been a lot of fun <laughs> it's been a lot of fun oh snap um yeah so we're still waiting on this. Is this the mob that drops the mask? Yes, Kunanoni. We're still waiting. It's a process. But in that process, we decided to talk a lot about things that make games so special and wonderful. Like, one of the weird things that I have found, and uh, I think that a lot of people who play a lot of like classic PC games can attest to, is that like, these old PC games, retro PC games, don't get. They don't get the um the 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 attention and love that a lot of uh, modern or, or like old console games get. You know, there's there's not a lot of recognition in comparison. Can you explain the process? I'm curious. What needs to happen? Or is it just RNG? So Kunonone, what's happening is that there is a a particular mob that drops this item. They don't drop it 100 percent. And also, there is a chance that what spawns is a placeholder mob instead. So it doesn't it doesn't reliably, the mob doesn't reliably spawn, and the item doesn't reliably drop. And so it's just a, a matter of luck. Um, and so that's what we have to wait for. But I've, I've been finding this. I've been finding this, this major distinction. Yeah, very much RNG. So RNG, yeah. Um, but what's beautiful about this is it takes time to talk. Like, I don't mind. Mine took roughly 22 hours. That was a bit unlucky, though. Cow, 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 don't say that to me. That scares me and makes me very sad. I cannot wait 22 hours. I've got an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> We've literally spent the, the entirety of this stream doing this. And I've been talking nonstop just about games, just to fill time. <laughs> but it's because also, like, I wasn't intending to stream uh, anything. We were supposed to do Infocom stuff, but it couldn't. So it's better to do this instead, um, which I don't mind because I enjoy just talking about games. But I've overcome this really big problem that I think that um, a lot of people see is that just PC retro doesn't get as much love as console retro. retro. 
Surprise, your voice is holding up. I hope you've been hydrating. Kunra no I've not had a single drink. My voice is, is faltering dramatically. <laughs> um, that we need to to highlight more PC retro games. They don't get the love that console stuff does. Uh, NES and that sort of thing. It's so fascinating to... We have to see one assassin or supplier. I don't know what that means, Mod Wolf, but I will uh, uh, take that as we are getting very unlucky. Um, so a lot of people don't recognize just all the things that PC gaming has done to shape the landscape of of games as as a genre in in general. Right, like you know, people have this love for JRPGs, but they don't recognize the fascinating aspect that a lot of JRPGs were inspired by and shaped by, um, by uh, the works of Ultima and Wizardry. How those games really ultimately shaped the two major branching paths of JRPGs. You know, do you talk about um, the bump mechanics of an ease game? That's just a natural evolution of what had Ultima had done with its combat system, the original Ultima games, right? It was just bumping into things and having damage be quantified by sterner stats. Ease was doing the same sort of thing. They just they were inspired by that sort of stuff. Then Wizardry, of course, being such a huge phenomenon in Japan and and the way that overworlds exist, you you think about a JRPG overworld, all that is is just a really graphically fancy version of the overworlds of games like Ultima. Um. One of the five names I got, one Cavalier and got the shoulders. This is like cycle number five. Holy smokes, Mod Wolf. Mod Wolf, at any point, you can say, I think we're done if you want to. You don't have to do this. I really appreciate dramatically that you have decided to come and help me in this way. Like, it means the world to me. I hope you're getting something out of this for this character. Are you getting XP for this at all or no? Like, I really don't want you to have to, you know, waste this time. I, I appreciate you doing this exponentially. I'll keep going until you stop. Is well worth having the mask. Well, that means the world to me <laughs> that you are willing to do that. The fine steel and gargoyle eyes sell for nice money. Well, at least you're getting some money out of it. So there is that, I guess. Um, And I appreciate that those shoulders and the, the hammer too. That was very helpful. That warm wall is going to be great. And the Apollets, even though they're more for, you know, the spellcasters and stuff like this, the the wisdom buff is nice, but it, the AC buff is huge because I was, you know, AC of two <laughs> was what it was before. Um, so it's interesting to see the genre shape by computer games, and uh, to see these evolutions of genres happen. The illusion masks make rogue such bards so much fun. That's just what I want. Mod Wolf is to explore more than anything. And that is going to be so fantastic. And what's great is that my level 16 is a rogue. So I can easily be like, here, Nick, hold this mask for me. I'm going to go get it on the rogue and put the mask on. Like, it, that's the two classes that I am, like, investing time in is rogue and bard. <laughs> so, like, that's very helpful. Um, But I love... I love, I have a love for old PC games and I have a love for, uh, games that it's a no, oh, it's a no drop. So once I get it, that's it. That's fine. No, no, no. You're right. Mod Wolf. That makes total sense. I totally get you. You know what? Songnesty is just going to be the one with the beautiful mask. That's just how it is. Um, I have a love for old PC games and I feel like we need to see those things more highlighted. And what stinks is that most people will are far more interested in like NES and SNES and Genesis, like those sorts of games. But they don't recognize just the pure awesomeness and majesty of these old PC games from like the late eighties and early nineties. They do some really amazing stuff. And we look at like uh, the Genesis being this amazing system for ports of fantastic PC games. Things like King's Bounty and uh, uh, Star Control and uh, Buck Rogers and those sorts of things. 
um, as well as games that are meant to be for PC, but ended up being developed for the system like Rings of Power. Um, oh man, Modwolf says, rogues can do this at level one and just leech off of someone doing the camp. Normally the mask rots, but bards have a ma major issue getting by the undead since they see through and vis. Oh, really? So like even, um, even if they are, uh, sneak and hide, they see through that. That stinks. Keyglyph says, Syndicate, I know. Key, and like, and, and the old school XCOM. There's just so much that old PC games have to offer that not a lot of people recognize. So full disclosure, I didn't play Syndicate. Nathaniel did. And I love the way the voice in the game says it. <laughs> I haven't heard of this, actually, Key. It's an all-caps robot monitor. Syndicate. Okay, Mod Wolf. That, at least there's that then. I mean, as a rogue, I, uh, I can do sneak and hide, so that's helpful at least. Um, and key, like there is a this fantastic game from the '80s that I had on my Apple II GS that was um uh uh War of Middle Earth. War. Oh, hold on, Middle Earth. Apple II GS. GS. It was War in Middle Earth, 1988. Uh, it is a... So people always talk about uh, Dune being um, the father of real-time strategy. Not true. There's many more. But one of another example of one being, um, you know, this fantastic uh, real-time strategy game is War in Middle Earth. It's a weird RTS before RTS was a thing, but it's also an RPG. Um, it's a weird RTS RPG hybrid. So you have this top down map of Middle Earth and you're doing the hobbits on the, the path to Mordor. You can split up the party. You can follow the path and do the canonical. Uh, this would be Apple 2GS, Amiga and DOS. I believe Kunanani. Yeah, the 2GS. Um, and so you could split up the party, follow the path canonically, but you also will eventually get access to other the armies of men and dwarves, and you can even like recruit them by going to the cities and things like this and doing like the fights. The Nazgul are running around and you're trying to avoid them. They even have I mean, it's a ten out of ten because you have um, you know, uh uh my boy Tom Bombadil. And it's just and so you have this faraway map view of all the units and stuff like this, and you can merge them into parties or split them. And there's like Frodo and Sam and Gandalf and all this stuff. Um, but then uh, you can also zoom in at any point and watch them as they go side scrolling, trekking through the land. And there's items that you can pick up that give you bonuses and stuff like this and NPCs and travelers that you can talk to. Um, and, uh, the combat is done in real time. It's almost it's almost kind of like an active time system. So it's happening in real time, and you're giving orders and commands to them, and you're watching them side by side. You're watching them up close do this combat, and it's just really cool. It's really interesting. Sakura's Syndicate is great. R.I.P. Bullfrog. I know. Sakura is a key. If you ever want to enthuse Sakura, she is fantastic to talk to about old PC games. Sakura loves this stuff. That's what they are primarily in life. But uh, I highly recommend this game. It's such an interesting game. It's, you know, it's a little slow paced, uh, but it's fascinating to see this wild open world RTS RPG hybrid thing. And it was a lot of fun. I had it as a kid, and I just obsessed over it. I just played it and played it and played it and played it so much. Um, I never beat it. I should play that at some point on stream. It's really good. So, yeah, it's just interesting to see the, the way that we view games. And this is War in Middle Earth is what it was called. 
War in Middle Earth. Not War for Middle Earth. War in Middle Earth. Yeah, War in Middle Earth. It was something else. It has... Yeah, so like in combat, you had orders. So you could have them charge, engage, withdraw, retreat. Like being in more defensive stances in varying degrees or be more aggressive stances and getting into fights with them. I mean, you technically, if you got lucky, I mean, you could, you could, uh, you know, dispatch the Nazgul and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you'd, you'd have meetings with the, the different uh, characters from Lord of the Rings at the places you're supposed to meet with them. Or do other very different things. And so there'd be moments where you're commanding these armies. Uh, ATM machine, so is the Apple II GS one. Um, I believe. The Apple II GS one also was a 32-bit color. Or 32 colors, yeah. The Apple II GS was, a, uh, was very Amiga-like in terms of its... Sound and colors and all that grand, grand stuff. It was really cool. I really enjoyed the Apple II GS. I don't know how in the world my family was able to afford such a thing. We were legitimately poor. My dad was a door-to-door -door salesman. And we he took odd jobs to survive. <laughs> and then one day, we went to pick up an Apple II GS. I was three years old at the time. I remember it very distinctly. It was late at night. The sun had already set. Um... And so this would have been like seven or eight o'clock at night because it wasn't fall yet. It wasn't cold. It wasn't fall because when we went into the store and it was about to close to pick up our thing and he showed my brothers how to do it. They showed me how to do it. Um, I think it was four at the time. I don't think it was three. I was probably four at the time. And um, that was like my first computer. And uh, like I learned how to use it. Yeah, I had the Apple II GS version. Absolutely, yep. Um, and uh, when we got it in the car, it was pouring rain. Like, it became a torrential downpour. Like, you couldn't see out the windshield. Uh, and I was, like, terrified as this little kid. I thought we were all going to die. <laughs> so, I was young at the time. I just remember very distinctly this this memory of this, of getting this thing. Oh. Ooh, things. Serrated? Ooh. What is this? I drank some water. Ooh. Yeah, they'll love that. There's a bag to put them in. Oh, dude, you're too kind. You're too kind. A light burlap sack. Weight reduction 65%. Whoa, I need that big time because I can't carry anything. Everything weighs so much. Everything weighs so much. Put my loot in there. <laughs> um, And so I had an Apple II GS as a kid. So the assassin spawned, but no mask. Oh, no! But that dagger will be very helpful for my, my rogue. Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, the Apple II GS was fantastic. Uh, so, like, one of my... Look, I was... I was positive I'm probably four at the time. Um, One of my first early game experiences was Manhunter New York. <clears throat> on the Apple II GS. Uh, it has the best music for it because it had, you know, a sound card. It wasn't internal sound like on DOS. And, um... It had really great music. I just remember this as a kid. And the colors were fantastic. It had a better color, of course, than the DOS version. And I was terrified. I was four years old, playing Manhunter New York. Right when did Manhunter New York come out? Let me see. Let me, I can tell you exactly how old I was then. Manhunter New York came out in 98 or 88. So I would have been five at the time. I was five years old at that time when I had it. Um... And so then, wow, that had been like right before we had moved back to Michigan from, from Sandusky, Ohio. Um, the eyeballs, there's these eyeballs that come out of these, this corpse's head. 
and float around, and if you stay around, they eat you. Because <coughs> they're baby eyeballs. I was terrified. Still somewhat terrified by Manhunter New York, honestly. Uh, have you ever played them? Uh, I mean, I, obviously, I'm guessing you have ADM Machine. You are a connoisseur of adventure games. Manhunter New York and uh, is a really flawed game. It's horrifically flawed. Sorry, I don't... Sorry, the frame light's all junky. Um, it is a really flawed game. But it if you subsist on potential, if you subsist on world building, like, it does stuff that is so amazing and so revolutionary. Because it's... It utilizes a mouse cursor before that was a thing. You know? Um, it's a it is a it's the mist style of adventure game before mist style adventure games existed. Before mist existed. Um and its presentation is top tier. It is top notch. Back from huge lurk, I remember Manhunter having some unfortunate arcade sequences that kind of ruined it for me. Some of them are great, Hesh. Some of them are atrocious. Uh, when I was a kid, there were some that were super hard for me. But now, I'm like, it wasn't that, it's not bad. There's one in particular that is like, it can jump off a cliff. Uh, the big one for me is there's this one where you have to climb through these ladders and do kind of a Donkey Kong style thing. All while avoiding these electricity, this electricity and stuff like this. And it was bananas hard. And it was really, really tough. There's some dead ending in the game that is is really uh, unfair. There's a lot of that that happens. Um, but typically when you die, the game sets you up to the point where you... Um, before you failed. And so even in those moments when you dead ended, it's like, oh... And those only happen, like, twice uh, in the whole game. And they're like, we have to send you back to way before when you made the mistake. Oh, did I get hit? I'm getting hit by something. Whew. Something hit me. Let's see. Bananas hard. Totally unripe bananas. Indeed key. But it's fascinating. Um, its world, its story is interesting. And if anyone has ever seen Sorry to Bother You, the movie Sorry to Bother You, they played Manhunter San Francisco. They made they played San Manhunter San Francisco. There's so much parallels between Sorry to Bother You and Manhunter San Francisco. There's a lot going on there. <clears throat> oh, the Wizards cast an AOE. Okay, good. I'm fine. We're all fine. Um, and so, but the Manhunter series is so interesting. I wish they'd come back. I wish we would see that series again remade. I would love to see that remade. Not Gold Rush remake. Like, a real, honest to God, you know, let's try this again. Because there are things that it does that modern adventure games and that style of stuff definitely attempted after the fact. It's a very much a precursor to a lot of these really interesting um, adventure game designs that happened a decade later and uh, and more. It's interesting. Key, what have you been playing? Have you been playing anything good? What has Nathaniel been playing? I'm so, so happy to see you, Key. It makes my day. For those who don't know, Key is my, it's one of my internet besties. Uh, they have been on in my streams since the beginning, so long ago. Um, her and Castle J are the like the two people that have stuck with me from the beginning through this wild journey of ups and downs. Um who I appreciate greatly in our talk of No Man's Sky. I mean, Hesh, you, you were, you're talking some No Man's Sky trash. <clears throat> Keegliff and I can tell you, No Man's Sky is beyond brilliant. 
um, in its story and world building and how it presents itself because it follows the the mist world of uh, closing the circle. You know, closing the circle is so important um, in narrative. I think allowing the player to fill in gaps and using uh, critical thinking to discover bits and pieces that uh, fill in the context of the world. And No Man's Sky does this in spades. It is so good. It's so good. Um, but uh, Key and I knew each other way back in Newgrounds. Not Newgrounds. Wow. Racket Boy, which is an old retro game forum. And... Uh, no Man's Sky definitely emboldened our friendship. My experience with No Man's Sky was very different. Oh, Hesh. I understand. I want to stress, Hesh, that I don't think that you're wrong because I I can see a person uh, play No Man's Sky and not encounter or experience even a single lick of its lore and history and story. I can see a person going into this and not experiencing any of that. Um, and so I get it. I'm looking into ways to play the earlier versions of No Man's Sky. It's not really the game that sets my heart on fire anymore, sadly. See, I'm with Key here, too. There is, like... We're not talking vanilla No Man's Sky. The The current day No Man's Sky is, is fun, but it's a lot more... Like, hey, we're all having fun. Woo! You know, ways to keep people just more engaged with the world, like uh, the base building and, and playing together. And those aren't bad things. But there are certain aspects of No Man's Sky in its earlier versions that are really interesting. Um, I was like, I don't know if you can play... I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, the, 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 the console version of the game, I guess, you could, if you, but you have to uninstall everything, though, that's a thing that Key is not willing to do. Key says, I know we love MMOs here, but I feel my experience was hurt by the MMOification of the game. Yeah. You can play vanilla No Man's Sky if you uninstall everything and never connect to the internet, but I'm looking into other ways. Yeah. Because I know Key would never uninstall and like delete the save games that she has in her PlayStation 4 No Man's Sky. Never in a million years. Key, did you ever do the VR? I don't know if that ever got fixed. Your problems with them? Yeah, never. Like, I, I hope to all goodness gracious that Key never gets into a situation where that data gets lost or gone. Like that is going to be one of the saddest days of, of Key's life. And it would hurt my soul. See the thing. I did. I loved it. But I had to take a break after Venus passed away. It's very associated with her. Back it up regularly. Nice. Um Yeah, I'm glad. Click your hide. It went off from the AOE. Oh, boink. I hid. Hopefully it succeeded. It just says you begin to hide. It doesn't tell me if it succeeded or not. I hope it did. I don't see myself. Try again. Yeah, see, like on my end, I don't see myself. There it goes. Okay. Whew. I also recently made blueprints of my base in the hopes of rebuilding it elsewhere. Key, this is good to hear. Um, I have found that, like, there are a few games that I see and I'm like, that's a key glyph game. But No Man's Sky, when I got to play it and experience it, and when like the first big updates to like base building and having this like story progression with base building, there was a moment in this in the base building story in No Man's Sky where you get this Corvax uh helper who's not connected to the to the Corvax mind, hive mind. It doesn't show an error if it works or not. The best way to tell us is 
con something. It'll be indifferent if it works. Okay. That is a good thing to know, Wormney. And I got the storyline aspect, and I was like, this is a key game. Yep. Immediately. Key needs to play it. Key needs to play this game. This is the game for her. Echo Analyst Wawani was mine. Oh, man. I had to immediately be like, that is immediately 100%. And I also had to make sure, and I, I know this very much so because Key is, again, dear friend, dearest friend, internet besties. Um, Like, I knew that there wasn't anything like that was going to be traumatic because <laughs> there could be some stuff. There have been people who have recommended games like, oh, no, that's not, no, there's stuff in there that is not okay. <laughs> it's like, that's not a key game. It's it's a bad idea. That's going to be just really sad and a downer. We're not doing that one. Um, But yeah, that game is, is special. Just talking about that game. It's such a fantastic, fantastic game. It's so transformative. It's really interesting. Yes, I get like the history of it launching, not with the promises that it wanted to make. And how it was, you know, it released too early. I really think that they had a contract with Sony and, like, they didn't get to pick that, put it out at the time that they wanted to, you know. Um, But it's it's fantastic. Oh, man. Key. Key. There are so many. Ugh. I was so happy when I played Monster Rancher and I was like, this is a key game. <laughs> this is a key game. This is what this is one of them doesn't happen very often. The only other ones that I like uh I have ever been like this is a key game is is, is Outer Wilds. And but I also know this and this is important and and Key taught me this. This is one of the most crucial things Key if you're, you're still here. One of the most crucial things you've ever taught me. Key says right now I'm back into my dog's genealogy thing. We also got a ring fit. I've heard Ring Fit's a lot of fun. Nick is a big fan of that. Other than that, I haven't been playing a whole lot. Getting used to the job takes up a lot of energy. Is it the interesting thing? So, key... Uh, no, it's not the interesting thing. One of the, the key things that I've learned from you as just a person in general is how I approach recommending games to people. Uh, I used to be very much that person like, you have to play this game. Why aren't you playing this game? Shame on you for not playing this game. It's the best game in the world. You need to play this game. Uh, I was very much like that kind of person, you know, was very in your face about it. Like, I know you will love this game. You have to play it. What's wrong with you? Key brought this very fantastic thing of this, like, like, you know, our uh our mood our our personal desire to want to play a game is what drives us to enjoy a game and so if you recommend a game and that person's just not in that perspective or in that headspace to want to play that game right now they're never going to enjoy it until they are and you constantly reminding that person and constantly like harking on them that they have to play that game is one of those things that will never make them want to play that game. <laughs> and for me, that was like the most, uh, one of the most, there's many, many key, one of the most uh, important lessons that I've ever learned uh, from just having a, a friendship with you, Key, was that I learned that perspective is incredibly important. Um, and cause like, like one of the things key for me was like, you beat Ultima four and I'm like, Oh, you're going to play Ultima five. That's going to be fantastic. And you're just like, that's going to be a while. <laughs> and I was like, but key, you loved Ultima four. It's like one of your favorite games of all time. And you're just like, there's a lot to that. You know, there's a lot to, to be in the headspace to want to play an Ultima game. And I was just like, okay, I respect this. Like, I have to, I have to, because I can never, ever play anything until I have this spark of flame in my heart for it. And Key, I'm exactly the same way. I'm exactly the same way. Which is why there are these moments when you get into, like, these emotional funks where you just don't want to play anything. You don't want to play anything. You just don't have that spark in you. Then what do you do? And for me, like, games, I love playing games. It's, like, my favorite thing. I love playing games. Um... And there are moments where I'm just like, I don't want to play anything. Eh. 
there were some times where I'm like, I don't really want to play anything. Why don't I just spend some time playing some like Halo or th things like that, you know? But uh, amazed by people who can like make lists of games they want to play and just go down the list. So like key, I make a list. I do make a list. We do it at the beginning of every year. We have a docket of games that we want to play. But uh, at the end of the year, we look back at it and like 70% of it is games that I've beaten that are not on that list. <laughs> but like, uh, because my, my heart, my mind, it goes somewhere else. But those are kind of guidelines of like, oh yeah, that's a game that that spark can happen at any moment. Those are ones I want to get to. And I have that spark there, but it's just not ignited at this moment. And uh, there are other instances where, like, there are a game that I, I do want to play at some point, but right now, that spark is not even happening. Like, the, the, the embers are dead, you know? And so, like, we're just going to put that on a low priority list. Maybe someday that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. He says, I have the master list in my head of games I'd like to play eventually if the stars align. There's no stress to it. Just happy I have all the stuff to look forward to. And I'm interested to see what dice gets rolled and which games come up. Like, I've had games on this mental list since I was a kid. Never finally sat down with until I, like, randomly found it at a garage sale. I love the serendipity of the universe. It inspires me. That's really how I do this. So, like, I make the list because... I want to be reminded of some games because my brain goes to so many and I know so many games, but like now so many of them sift through my brain. So like Sakura mentioned the game Earth and Beyond before, I have no recollection of her bringing that up. But when my good friend Mike brought it up, and I was like, this is interesting. So I was like, yeah, I told you about this. I'm like, I now feel horrible because I do not remember this. And I feel bad. <laughs> like, horribly. Because, like, I should remember that. I should have remembered that. I should have taken it seriously. And, like, I feel bad because then that means that at that point in time, my brain was just like, nope, not important. When it should have been important. Because that looks like a really interesting game. But the spark just wasn't there at that time. It wasn't there at all. And I was just like, yeah, that sounds great. I will not get to it for a long time. And now I'm like, I can't wait to get to that. I can't wait to get to that. That's going to be a fun one. Because that's just weird. It's weird how that works. Our brains. That's why I think it's so important to go in and, and think about the whys of things. When you're playing these sorts of games, yeah, I know this is this is one of the strangest streams I've ever done. This is really legitimately one of the strangest streams I've ever done. I've been streaming now for three hours and twenty three minutes. For three hours and twenty three minutes, <laughs> I have been sitting in this spot, <laughs> just talking. Um, like think about the whys. Why am I enjoying this game? Why am I driven to play this? What is it that compels me to continue? What what engages me? These sorts of things can... Uh, these sorts of things can help you better understand you as a person and your taste in games. And what are the elements that you find to be attractive and engaging and interesting so that you can identify them in other games and enjoy them more? Kunononi says, I've enjoyed the chat. This is what a lot of people say they stay for. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I I feel like I talk all the time. I'm just waiting for a mask. Apparently. <laughs> The darn dead head ba -doob. Um I'm glad you do Kunaroni. I I this is a thing I enjoy doing is talking about games and listening to folks. Um 
that the that games are a thing that connect us. You know, I I always I always rant about connections, and I think that games be they single player or multiplayer what have you why i stream in general is to to connect with other people and to enthuse about games and to to intrigue or inspire the games to, uh, people to try out or or experience other games in any format be it watching or playing really we've been here for three and a half hours. <laughs> okay, I can't laugh. Um, yeah, I'm with Hesh. Yeah, like talking about games as much as I do playing them. That's the truth. Hesh, I'm going to be... Uh, this is the EQ I remember, Sasakura. But darn it, says, oh, wow, jeez. <laughs> No worries, Key. Welcome back. Um, so, like, I just love talking about games, listening to people and news about games, giving people an opportunity to, like, just go nuts about what they love about a game. Key's gonna tell me something that she learned from me. Key, you're gonna make me cry. Whatever it is, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> I get so uncomfortable when people talk uh, nice things about me. <laughs> I'm I am ready to be uncomfortable, Key. Please, because I've lived in a, a a vacuum where I don't get nice things said about me. <laughs> so, just since I played zero MMOs growing up, I did not ex actually know that fans were keeping old MMOs alive by running servers out there in the ether. And the tour you took me on through Uru was such an amazing experience. Uh, he, I'm reading the Book of Atris right now, which is the the fiction novels that are set in the, the Mist universe, which are really good. And uh, there's a portion in the first book, the Book of Atris. Um Thinking about a lot, the ruins of an MMO that is the ruins of a civilization, haunting, beautiful, so sad. Um, and there's a point in this book key where um, Atris, the main character, they are a kid and being led to their dad to the city of Denis for the first time, and he's never seen it before in his life. He's been told stories about it, and he thought they were just works of fiction. And he goes and he sees the lake and the city and he sees all of these amazing things and is wandering through the streets of this long dead city. And I'm like, it's, it's the descriptions of these things remind me so much of, of seeing that city for the first time myself and falling in love with it. Uh, so on both levels, game and metagame, you're experiencing ruins. It's just fascinating. Um, and uh and key like i just i i think about uru and mist online like every day every day the cool executioner has his axe um uh I key I think about Mist Online every single single day. Oh, if I make a character that can use it. Ah. Ah. Okay. I'm good. But thank you. Like I just uh it... So Key, I don't know if you know this, but Mist Online is getting new stuff. Um, okay. And I will happily take it. Um, there's fan stuff for Mist. 
that it's being implemented into the official servers. And it's beautiful. Oh, sorry, you were shouted over. Um, so uh, there's Mist Online. The official servers are now getting fan stuff. Uh, so fan content and fan journals and fan ages are being slowly fit into the world. Um, and so like there's a there's a library that was made for it very specifically for the fan content and so like one of the first ages that was released was an age that's sole purpose was to recognize all of the people who uh who were fans of the game that passed away and like there's there's books that you can read about all of the people and there's just so many and like all the things they did it wasn't just names it was also like what they did for a living and you know oh fun i got it oh i got another dagger oh well, we can at least say that we got something out of this we don't get a mask um and it was just wild It was wild to see that key. And so, like, they have garden ages that people have made and that sort of stuff. And they have um, just a, a, a world of, of things. It's really interesting. And, like, people have written, like, journals and things like that that get put into the library that people can read that talk about, like, their in-character, you know, description of them trying to understand how to write books and make these worlds and experiment and how all those things kind of work out. It's really fascinating. And it is an absolute heartwarming experience. This thing that you love so much and how there's still people holding that torch, um, which is why I love playing old quote unquote dead MMOs. <laughs> I love seeing the torch being carried because these most of these things are lost. Like, um, you know, Key, I've always talked about like my love for the old SSI uh, uh, RP computer RPGs, Dark Sun, Shattered Lands. Like, it's one of my favorite computer RPGs. You know, there's an MMO on the AOL platform that was made by the same company using the same engine in the Dark Sun universe that had the whole world of dark sun in it you can't play that game it's gone you will never play that game uh i'm a good friend hesh ballantyne's channel he's got a person who heard me talk about it and it's like i'm on a i'm on a mission and they were like hunting down all of the people who were involved in that game in hopes of finding something you know um kiffer yeah oh man hesh Ugh, I got I got a private message them and let them know how much I appreciated even them putting that much effort into it from the get go there. Just trying to decide the most tactful way of contacting them. Oh, like I there are two two games that are lost to time that would get me very emotional if I saw them again. And that would, because I've never played Burning Sands, Dark Sun Burning Sands, the Dark Sun MMO. That would be one of them. They're all working people with current projects, so it's like, who knows exactly. It's like, they're really busy, but maybe I've got something. Um, And then the other one is a VR1 Crossroads. Some games you can't play anymore, I miss due to them being multiplayer server-based, Tribes Ascend, Nazgoth... Legends of Norath. <sighs> yeah, Mudwolf. I think that Nazgoth got a bad rap. I get it. People wanted a soul, a Legacy of Cain game, and Nazgoth wasn't it. But Nazgoth was doing some interesting things. Tribes Ascend. That was so like I had been around, and, you know, computer games and such at the time for when Tribes like first came out. But like I first actually got to play Tribes through Tribes Ascend. And I really liked it. It was crazy. I played a lot of Tribes Ascend. And I really enjoyed that game a lot. 
Um, it is a shame. Key says the one I can't play Bogus and knows about. Key, I cannot tell you. I legitimately like every two or three months, I look it up. Key, I look up that Sailor Moon chat room game from the AOL days, and I get like people always talking about. Oh yeah, I remember that game. That was amazing. Oh, that was so great. I wish we had something like that on Discord. And people are like, yeah, we might work on it. And then like nothing ever happens of it. Because you could easily do it on Discord, I think. Even a chat room bot, design your own program so you could customize one yourself. I started doing that as a kid. SM Battle, I love you and I will find you again. And Key, I look for it always because I think that's fantastic. I was so excited when I found like the Pokemon game that was kind of... Like that, it's not the same. And I was like, eh, it's not, it's not what Key was looking for. <laughs> it's not the same, and it bothered the hell out of people in my Discord <laughs> that that existed. <laughs> same idea. And, because, like, there's a, you know... Oh, man, Key, my daughters, uh, they're both really into... There is this, there is this Sailor Moon-style show. It's for a younger audience. It's Korean. You know, it's a, it's a magical girl thing, but it's very, very, very Sailor Moony. And it's called Catch Teeny Ping. <laughs> they freaking love this show to death. It's about this princess from space uh, who comes down to Earth and they, her space library or something has all these little creatures called teeny pings. They're these little guys. And they embody these very different facets of people uh, for good and for bad. And they land on Earth. They escape and land on Earth. And she has to catch all of them to like put them back or put them in her menagerie of friends that like help them and stuff like this. And it's very Sailor Moon. Very Sailor Moon. In like just the themes, but it's more more younger audience and i'm like man they're gonna lose their mind for sailor moon when they get older yeah these little guys they're just and it's it's a cg thing you know and so you have like giggle ping is the main antagonist he's this guy that causes a little dude who causes mischief and and like gets all of these other creatures to like do mischief even though like though they're kind of good intentioned and causes all this trouble. And he's actually like a good guy, but he's just misunderstood and blah, blah, blah. It's just really, it's very silly and kid stuff. And the, the voiceover is like really bad, (laughs) you know, the dub is really bad, but they really love it. And they love the characters and they love the story and like the ideas. And there are moments when it gets a little dark, you know, but it's not so dark that it's scary for them and they love it to death. And I was just like, yeah, you guys will be down for Sailor Moon when you get a little older. So I was very excited about that because Sailor Moon's awesome, man. Sailor Moon's great. It's such a great show. Oh, man. It's really crazy. Uh, my kids, so they watched um, Encanto recently. We're, let's talk about my kids for a second. My my youngest just turned four, Gwendolyn. We watched um, Encanto recently key great movie in Kanto um and my youngest was it's about this family uh that live in this uh this like magical town and they're all imbued with powers the family is I saw in Kanto was actually terribly confused oh really oh man um there's a lot of cast of characters and it can be very confusing the oldest that's super duper strong my youngest, she's like, that's who I want to be when I grow up. She's like, I want to be that lady. I want to be super strong and carry donkeys. <laughs> and she listens to her song on repeat 24-7. I love the world building, but at the end I felt like I'd missed major plot points, even though I'd seen the whole movie. I get to, It moves really fast, Key. And there's so many... There, the problem that I had with it is just that there's so many characters. It's hard to keep track of who is who in the family. There's just so many people. And so it's just like, wait, are you her sister or her aunt 
or are you your cousin? Like, wait, which who are you again? <laughs> um, so there's a lot going on. I don't think you're crazy, Key. Um, but yeah, my youngest uh, thought that the uh, the oldest sister of the main character, who's the super strong one, she's like, I want to be that person when I grow up. I want to be able to pick up houses and move boulders. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, that's awesome, man. Go for it. We support these things. These silly things that our kids say they want to do. I'm like, yeah, why not? Go for it. You want to go bodybuilding? Why not? Sure. <laughs> You're four. Kunanoni says in 97, Activision bought up this game called Netstorm Islands at War. Real-time strategy game, but not in the traditional sense. The game is played on a bunch of islands in the sky. You have to build bridges to the different islands to build different offensive and defensive units. You defeat your opponent by capturing their high priest. Whoa. Key says, Gwendolyn will lose her marbles for hammer if you play Fable 2 with her someday. Oh, man, Key. Fable 2 is coming up soon, by the way. It's coming up soon. <clears throat> I might play Fable 2 right after I beat Shining the Holy Ark. Um, key, I got... Hold on. Do I have them all here? Where is it at? I don't think I put... Where did I put them? Maybe they're in here. Are they in here? No. What did I do with them? Key, so I bought Fable... Fable 2, Fable 3, the Fable Connect game, and the Fable family-oriented beat-em-up game on Xbox Live Arcade for the 360. I bought them all. I bought the whole series. And, uh, because I had, I had this old Xbox 360 that was given to me because my old one had died, um... Uh, this guy I knew ran a like a computer store, and he's like, "Oh, I'll fix your your red ring, no big deal." And I was like, "It red rings though, like it gets fixed, and it red rings after like two hours. It'll red ring every time." He's like, "Ah, I'll get it, I'll get it fixed." And he was like, "I can't fix this," <laughs> and I was like, "No one can, even like go send it in officially to get fixed." And there was like, "Nope." can't fix it um and so he was like here have mine and i was like what you don't have to give me that it's, like, it's no big deal here have this one uh and it worked great and then the drive died like the disk drive did it wasn't reading the discs or so i thought years and years and years later just recently i took it out of storage because i was going through stuff in storage it's like i wonder if this works i plugged it in and i tried it and it worked just fine read all the discs and so I was like, I want to play some 360 games. What should I play? And I was like, Fable. Oh. Ho, ho, ho. So I went to an old used game store just to see how much they were. And like, I got Fable 1, 2, 3, and the Fable Connect games for like five bucks. <laughs> like five bucks. And I was like, yep, there we go. Sold. Because you can't get Fable 2 anywhere else but the 360, right? Um, sorry. Kunononi says it was so different from the RTS games coming out. Sadly, Activision didn't market it well, so it didn't sell well. Can you still play it, or is it multiplayer only? Kunononi played the old RTS game called Baldies. Oh, I have not. My oldest brother got into was an alpha tester for. Settlers 3 for online multiplayer. It's in the manual, too. For, credited for it. Um, I never played the Baldies. Interesting. Dark Rain series, Battlezone series. Games were rarely multiplayer only back then. Interesting. So yeah, key. I can't wait. I will definitely check out the Fable Two stuff because I'm I'm gonna be knee deep in that. 
I'm gonna check out. Let me check out Netstorm. Islands at War. War. Netstorm. Islands at War. Okay, so it is a, still a thing you can play. Wow, this is interesting. That's wild. There's um, there is a a game kind of like that out now that came out really recently. <laughs> I live in out of character right now. Uh, Mod Wolf is complaining that we have not found the damn mask, and everyone's like, it still hasn't dropped. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I wish. That's ridiculous. That's wild. Can download the full game. Interesting. Wow, okay. It was intended for multiplayer. Interesting. One I really love. There's one I really, really enjoy um, that you can get on GOG now. Which is really nice, but you could get it for free previously on there. It was uh, like a vaporware. Um, I really liked the Warlord series. Um, it was a turn-based strategy RPG. Uh, Warlords three um, was fantastic. I don't know if anybody's ever played Warlords. That was a really good one that I enjoyed. It was a hero-based uh, strategy game, uh, turn-based strategy that was really just wild. Kunononi says, and the website doesn't exist anymore. Oh, man. Sagra says, Warlords is excellent. The Warlord series is fantastic. Because I, I can't do... I have a real hard time with... um I have a real hard time with real-time strategy games. Just because my brain can't parse everything. You know? It's too much for me. It's too much for me. You guys even saw when we played suspended the infocom text-based adventure game the moment when you can issue orders to a variety of different robots like simultaneously and then just kind of wait for them to to do those acts it was too much for my brain real-time strategy games are crippling for me that is the genre that is the hardest for me i i can't I can't understand how to play those games with a lot of other stuff. I can at least understand it, but I can't sometimes just can't do it. Like a lot of shmups, like I get shmups, but like, I, I am just like, I don't have the patience to get good at this game. I'm not, it's not for me, but RTS, I'm like, I don't even remotely understand what it takes to be successful. I can't micromanage in that way. It just doesn't work. Sakura says, speaking of RTS, I played some Supreme Commander Forged Alliance some, uh, today. Love that game. Mod was going to play some Baldies now. Yes! Something I can pause and play. Dirt Nap Noob says, Forged Alliance is one of the best RTSs of all time. Forged Alliance. Supreme Commander. Um... That's great, man. I I need to understand. I need to understand. One day, probably not this year. One day I'm going to play an, an RTS on stream. And and summon the help. I mean, black and white is an RTS, Quiet Sakura. It's an RTS. Um and black and white's on the list. My problem with black and white is that, like, I, uh, <laughs> my problem with black and white was weird is that, like, back in the day, I didn't care at all. But now as, like, an adult, a responsible and compassionate person, like, having to chastise your animal, and the only way to do so is to hit them. Like, this is actually really terrible. This is actually really terrible. And I'm very reticent to play this game. Because, like, I don't want to hit anybody. I don't want to hit my little creature that I'm raising. That's not okay. <laughs> you could throw them, too. Ugh. Total Annihilation is great uh, if you get over the graphics. It's the father of Supreme Commander. 
Interesting. It was a Peter Molyneux game, Hesh. Okay, it's netstorm.net, and they have a Discord community. Kudunoni, that is good to hear. Wait. Oh, wait. Oh, no. <laughs> Kudunoni. Netstormhq.net. There we go. That's what we're talking about. Have I gone through all my... Am I thirsty? Oh, I got some water. I'm good. I still got things. I got water for days. I got rations for days. I'm fine. Um, That makes my day, Kununoni. That's the stuff that I love. I love... I love just communities. Like, I love seeing those people who love this game more than anything. What I hate is, like... Ooh. I will... I will take that cooler break. <laughs> Be right back. I'm going to get a cooler break. Be right back. All right, I'm back. Thank you for looking out for me, Kuno Noone. I do not take care of myself. Someone did win the haiku book, but they have not responded to me. I'm going to give them another message and give them another 48 hours, and then I'm going to do another draw. Um, So, like, I was saying before, um, community, right? There's nothing that's more exciting when you get a community that's, that is for a, a you know, long-forgotten game by the public but there's this hardcore fan base that loves it to death the only time when it's a negative is when those people uh are elitist and gatekeeping and mean it's happened in a few communities that i have found it's not common it's very uncommon because 99.9 percent .9 of the time those people are just extremely excited that there is somebody out there that is interested in this game that they love that has not had that experience, you know, that doesn't have the, is coming into it with fresh eyes. Like me playing EverQuest. Like, yeah, I know EverQuest. Yes, I've played some EverQuest. Have I played any that has given me any experience or any knowledge? No, <laughs> none. <laughs> I'm getting the real life experience here of just sitting here waiting for this thing, man. This poor thing. This poor mask. Um, but like Mod Wolf, 75% of the reason we are hunting for the mask. Uh, again, I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> I will be forever in your debt for this. Because like uh Sakura says I'm thinking something like Warhammer 40 K Dawn of War 2 control four or five units, no base building, decent RPG like progression for the units. Isn't that like the same case for um there's one that is uh hold on. I have it, I own it. It's uh like a Greek one. It's like a Greek mythology one. Isn't that one also like a... what is it? It's it's near the bottom of my list. Um so I've got Warhammer 40, 40k Dawn of War, Game of the Year edition. Um, where is it? 
Titan Quest. Isn't that one also like that? I feel like Titan Quest is. It's a... Isn't that an RTS? But yeah. It's Diablo in Greece. Okay. I always was under the impression that it is a RTS. Not Dawn of War 1. Dark Crusade is such a fun world map where you take over sections of the map. Titan Quest is like Diablo. Really? I was always on the assumption that that was like an RTS, like a hero-based RTS. What I would give, what I would give to play Warcraft 3 in its original, you know, concept, the screenshots from back in the day, an RTS with just like a singular hero and small-scale units of like four and five people. Yeah, yeah, we're going for something smaller scale. I get overwhelmed easy. I can't micromanage. Key, it is so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming in, Key. I mean this, it... Okay, fingers crossed. Um, but if it doesn't, eh, that's okay. Key, before you leave real quick... Thank you. I know you have a really busy schedule going on, and life has just been life. It is so good to see you. Whenever you're able to come in, I'd love to have you here. I love chatting with you. Your dear friend. Good night. Um. So, well, no, Kuno no Oni. Um, I mean, was is that the case with Warcraft Three prior to the Reforged version? Because, like, from what I remember, the original intention of it, again, uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why I love old video game magazines is because you get this weird perspective of games that doesn't have the foresight that we have now. But they were talking about Warcraft 3 and what it was. And they had the screenshots. It was almost a, like, over not over the shoulder but like really close cam you had your hero and just a couple units and that was it and you were going through the landscape like doing stuff like uh, and engaging in real time strategy style but like very hero based and very smaller scale but am I wrong because again I could be mistaken on how Warcraft 3 ended up being because I don't know the genre. <laughs> We're looking for... Uh, Stream Easy, by the way, welcome. We're getting a mask. Scared the crap out of me. Uh, thank you for the follow. Um, we're camping for the mask that turns me into a dark elf. I am just sitting here looking pretty while a higher level person does all of the work. <clears throat> They added that as a scenario that you play as Thrall. Okay, Kunoni, that's interesting. That's good to hear. I didn't know this. That's exciting. Um, so I don't know what I'm camping. I don't know the name of this mask. Uh, I am stream easy. I am a <clears throat> very inexperienced EverQuest player. Uh, I have been playing uh, Project 1999 for like four years. Never got anything higher than a level 16. And that level 16, I got over the summer. Because I play this game very differently. <gasps> Wormney, what you got for me? Hello. Hooray! Hooray! Did you get it? No? No, they didn't get it. No. They're just saying hooray because they're doing all the work for me. Run green right now. That dude has an SS robe. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, uh. That was the first thing I played when I got the game. <laughs> That's awesome. Because, yeah, I was really excited for that idea. I thought that I was like, That's going to be the, the, the first RTS that I'll get into. Um. <clears throat> you run uh, Project 1999. Run green server right now. 
And um, so I've never had a character more than level 16, which I just got this year over the summer. And, um, oh, what class am I? Oh, a bard. Yeah, I'm a bard right now. Uh, level 15. So this is the one that we're going to be doing kind of solo. When if Nick ever decides to come and play with me more, my good friend Nick, uh, he it was a halfling druid and I was a halfling road. No songs in? Uh, I may have died at some point and I'm just sitting here waiting for things now. <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to pop up. Uh, yeah, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not good at this game. I only the, so like, for instance, I don't know how to pull. I'm starting to understand pulling a little bit better as a bard. Like I'm starting to understand how that works. Look, I've been playing for a very long time. <clears throat> again, never gotten anything past level 16. What I do most of the time is like make a enchanter, get to level five, get minor illusion and uh spend my time messing around with people with my minor illusion spell um and that's how i spend most of my day playing this game i have a 51 druid on blue and a level 9 druid on green might have to play green a bit more maybe turn that map turn up i mean play what you want to play as long as you're having fun that's all that matters um and I explore the cities. I talk to NPCs. Um, you know, like just earlier this year, I mean, I found a undocumented quest that no one on Alakazam or on the Project 1999 wiki did. It's a small one. It's inconsequential. It's a delivery quest. But no one wrote it down. <laughs> That's what I do, is I hail everybody. I talk to everybody. I do a whole big variety of different, you know, um, questions and stuff like that and dialogue to get information, make sure that information has been recorded somewhere. And I learn more about the game world. I learn more about its story and the lore and the more intricate uh, quest design that is involved in this whole series. And like I, I, I'm a person who loves to do stupid role play, you know, it's not serious and severe role playing. It's being a silly character and doing silly, fun, and stupid things, and uh, being a person who just explores a lot of tomfoolery. We will absolutely, you know, host, um, you know, funeral services for a corpse that's about to disappear, <laughs> and gather and just shout to the high heavens, and be on so many people's ignore list because we annoy the crap out of them. As we lament the loss of, uh, you know, this this person's corpse, or get money off of people for having them pay us to talk to a fortune telling spinning tree, that's just my friend in tree form to get their fortunes told. Why not? <laughs> Why not? That's the fun of the game for me. Um, and now I'm very much like, I want to see more of this world. Uh, you're nuts. <laughs> you have no idea. There was a, a, there was a stream that I did way back in the day where I spent two hours in Kinos with an enchanter doing minor illusion where I turned into the flagpoles that are, um, at the Kinos gates. And just trying to sell people a two-week adventures correspondence course um, as the spinning flag from the Kino Skates. Like, inquire if this is the spinning flag at the Kino Skates. And no one bought it. No one invested. I was like, look, it's just 20 silver. And you will get yourself, you know, a two-week correspondence, adventures correspondence course. And, uh... I redid that bit with the rogue, uh, the halfling rogue, and somebody was like, sure, I'll do it. And um, when it was time for my correspondence course to be given to them, I, w I, gave, I like, saw they were online. I gave them a tell. It's like, are you ready for your, your weekly correspondence course? 
And they're like, what? <laughs> like, W-U-T, what? It's like, you sign up for a, a two-week adventure correspondence course. Are you ready for your correspondence course? And they're like, are you serious? And I was like, I'm incredibly serious. And they're like, I thought you were joking. It's like, we don't take adventuring correspondence courses as a joke. We're very serious. We're professionals. And it's like, all right, sure. And so I was like, I had the macro all set up. And I'm like, here it is. Here's the tip to survive. Here's the tip. But like really poor misinformation that was just not helpful. And their response was like, that's weird. And then nothing ever again. And I was like, are you ready for your next week of correspondence course? Nothing. And I was like, I'm going to send it anyways. No response. (laughs) And I was like, you know what? They paid me to platinum. He got a he got two weeks worth of uh, adventurous correspondence courses. I plan to go for twenty two hours until you get this mask or whatever. No ATM machine. I'm gonna be done soon, soon. I have nothing going on tomorrow except for me reading a book. We're staying home, cleaning. We have so much food in our fridge right now for my daughter's birthday. We were hoping to get it during the stream. Exactly. <clears throat> How nice will it be at the next one? Hey, ATM Machine, happy birthday. Happy birthday, ATM Machine. <laughs> happy birthday, ATM Machine. ATM Machine. Happy birthday. ATM Machine. Happy birthday. (gasps) Folks, I have something to tell you. Something scandalous. So, okay, real talk. 34 years old, nice. I'll be 39 this year, apparently. Uh, My wife, she's a nurse. Fantastic, fantastic human being. I love her dearly. She has a coworker who is a secretary. This guy who wanted to get into streaming. He spent $4,000 to get a setup to stream. Not on a computer, but on a big TV and a bunch of lights. Later this year, I'll be 21 again. And their perspective was like, it'll be easy. I'll just, you know, stream and I'll be making money in no time. And I thought this was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. (laughs) I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. It doesn't work like that, man. Like, what are you going to play? And I was like, I didn't ask him that. I just thought that was, I was like, you need to talk to my husband. It is not that easy. (laughs) And I was like, it's not that easy, man. Um, and so this guy really believed that he was just going to start streaming PlayStation 5 games on his PlayStation 5 and just make money. That's what he was going to do. And didn't know, like, he's like, wait, you stream on your computer? And it's like, yeah, he's like, I do my research. You know, it's going to be easy. He did the research. You stream on a computer? Yeah, you stream on a computer. How can you see anything on that little screen? I'm like... Okay. Uh, and like, uh, so, have you ever played Astron's Call? I was wondering how well the Astron Call EMU is compared to P99. During that dump, I have actually played the Astron's Call. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of them. Um, there is, uh, there's an Astron's Call, like a really popular one that does more, um, more fan made stuff. And a lot of the, a lot of the, all the accoutrements, all the extra stuff. There's a, a hardcore vanilla server that exists. It's a little more niche, but it still has a it has a pretty decent user base. Um, and it's like launch Asherin's call, and it's really good. Um, it's good. 
the game is very different. And I have to really, like, I have to find someone to play with for that. I guess with all the MMOs, I need, like, one person, you know? Um, But this guy, he wanted to... Uh, he spent all this money, $5,000, and really thought he would make it back in, like, a month. And it was one of the strangest things I'd ever heard. And then all of a sudden... And the name, too. He had a name. He paid for, like, a an opening graphic. He paid this 3D artist, an animator, to do this. And I'm not going to give his username. Uh, and it was, like, the dumbest username. <laughs> it's really like, oh, that's what you're going with. It's not a good username. It's not. That's, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. You spent you spent how much on that? Okay. Not quite. And then we learned that they were gonna do some and so I was like, I felt bad because like I was making fun of this person. And then they were like talking about doing like NFT streams and talking about NFTs and trying to sell NFTs to people and I was like, Okay, I don't feel so bad anymore. Uh but then they decided not to do it. <laughs> Sephiroth Drizzit sixty nine. Yeah. Um and so he uh, he then decided to return mo- all the stuff, right? But he was going to still, because like, I don't have the time to do this. I found out that it takes a lot of time. And so he's going to keep the username, and he's going to make his wife stream in a costume related to the name and do uh, mukbangs. And ASMR. And I was just like, she consents to this? <laughs> this guy is more nuts than you. And I was just like, because I've seen this before. I knew this. Um, so about a year, two years ago, about two years ago now, there was a streamer that would come into chat and like engage and like, seemed like a really nice person, great person. And they were like, Hey, check out my streams and stuff like this. It's like, Oh, that's great. And what it was, was this guy was making his wife stream video games in a hope for her to make money. And he was posing as her and doing all the, like going into people's streams and talking and advertising and stuff like this, but posing as her and she did not want to do this. And it was like one of the craziest things I'd ever seen. And I was like, this is tragic and incredibly like sad. And I was like, so this guy's story, I'm like, oh my god, this sounds like this. I'm having like flashbacks to this really shady, abusive relationship thing. I'm like, please, oh god, this is wild. You're going to make your wife dress up in a costume and eat food and do ASMR. That's not, that's, and think that they're going to make money. You're not making money with that. You're not. It was really, really gross. <laughs> it's like, this is weird. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why do you think that's going to work? I want, because all I do is, all I can see is imagining this person in really. Oh, hey, Gwendolyn. How are you doing, baby? Oh, my youngest is awake. You having a tough time sleeping? Oh, you okay? Why don't you go up and sit with Mama? You want to go there with Mama? Yeah. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to go walk her upstairs. I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> oh. Honey, I'll go get you. All right, I'll be right back.
I. Whew. Yeah, my youngest was just up. Uh, so, no, one of the things that I thought was so funny about this person was that I just imagine this woman dressed in, like, a really bad cosplay, like, really cheap stuff, sitting there eating food and a microphone, <laughs> and there's just zero people watching, and, like, I don't know what they're expecting, like, I was, like, I asked my wife to, like, to tell him, like, are you talking to anybody, like, are you in streams talking to people, and, like, or networking or just like genuinely have an interest in the community that you are trying to be a part of. And there's like, Nope. I was like, that's, and you spent how much money? $5,000. I'm having a panic attack for you. I was having a panic attack for that poor guy. Just a bad idea. It was a bad idea. Anyways, oh. now I'm wondering how I'm going to get out of this place. <laughs> like, it's one o'clock. We're supposed to be ending the stream. How am I going to get out of here? <laughs> We're so screwed. Just a total not get it moment. Yeah, Sakura. It was gnarly. We'll have to find out. Oh, let's get, let's try one more. And Mod Wolf, we'll try one more and we'll see how it goes. So, man, like for people who stream, like it's a lot of work. You do a lot of work to stream. If you want to have people coming in and talking to people, you have to do a lot to. It's not easy to play a video game and talk at the same time. You know, it's not easy to you have to have something. It's 10 minutes until the next spawn. I can wait 10 minutes, Mod Wolf. I can wait 10 minutes. Well, this will be the last one. We'll see how it goes. My thing is that, like, if you're streaming, you have to... If you are trying to get people to come in and talk, you have to do one of two things. One, be incredibly good at video games. Or two, be incredibly funny. Or three, have something to say. Something of interest. You know, uh, be it talk about game design, you know, that sort of thing. Stream is only half the job, too. There's so much offline. There's so much. I mean, to even just, like... Like, I made a hall of butts. <laughs> I made a virtual 3D... Fully 3D, fully explorable art gallery dedicated to the butts of Shining Force. and shiny, The Shining Force series. With a guided, narrated audio tour. That's a lot of work. <laughs> that was a lot of work. That was so much work. <laughs> but it was worth it because, one, I thought it was funny. And two, I enjoyed Shining Force a lot. And I enjoyed rating all of the butts of Shining Force. Because it was something to do. It's a fun little thing to do. Um, but, like, if I was trying to do this as a quote-unquote career, like... Man, like, no, <laughs> have fun with it. You're supposed to be just playing games. <laughs> Don't go having your wife do a stupid ASMR food eating stream. Like, no. Do you find if you're having fun? Sure, do it. I don't know if anybody has ever done a f like a food eating stream trying to do ASMR that's like this is fun <laughs> I like doing this so I don't know it's just weird streaming is like a lot of work it's a lot of work because like I mean if you want to do it if you want to do it well I don't do it even remotely well and I still put a lot of work into it <laughs> I don't do it even remotely well. <laughs> my lighting is terrible. My microphone is not the best. It's a process. It's a, you know, it's a slow thing. But, like, you did it for about a year. Yeah, Sakura. Oh, my gosh. Even just understanding the basics of how to work these things is a lot. It was just very funny to see this person. Like, yeah, I did my research. It's really easy. It's like, well, what software are you using to, to broadcast? And it's like, what? It's like, well, how are you capturing your game? And 
It's hard to hit that life button. It is so hard, Sakura. Um, but like, I don't know. It's it's weird to see people who get into this for money. It's like who? I mean, there are some people who I guess are, are genuinely talented, who genuinely have like something, right? But then I see a lot of people who are just like playing this stuff, like doing the weird market research to like find out what games bring in the best audience and doing a lot of like that sort of stuff. I'm just like, I don't, that's not, that's not for me. I'm fine with other people doing that, but like there have been some people in this world who I really enjoyed as like a person in this like community of retro games and stuff. Who was who had flat out said to me that, uh, that we weren't gonna be friends because I wasn't marketable, and I was like, I didn't think that this was a career move, <laughs> like me talking to you and like playing games together. No, it wasn't me making a career move, and then it's like, yeah, you're not marketable. And it's like, okay, well, that was nice. Play games with you. Have a good one, man. Like, good luck. <laughs> oh, they're still doing stuff, Sakura. They're doing great. They're doing great. They're doing just fine. Um, but no, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it was just weird. <laughs> I found that it has been very weird. It has been a weird place. Like no karma. Nope. I don't mind. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm legitimately not very upset about it because I just moved on and just did other things, but I thought it was very mean and very strange. Like a person super nice to you. And then you realize that they were doing it as a career move. And then they were like, yeah, it's not working out. Like I banked on you and you didn't perform. So goodbye. It's like, that's weird. That's weird. Cause that was not my intent. I just wanted to play games. Good fun time. It was weird. Um, but no, I found that the 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 streamer community is ninety nine point nine percent fantastic people who are just playing because are doing the stuff because they love it, you know, like the retro people. Um, and then there's just this weird like point one percent that is just strange and skeezy and just Ugh. like their rumors like everyone is competition. And I'm trying to make it to the top. It's like, really? Really? I'm trying to be like cutthroat about it. It's weird. Me and Bob and my dunce bars are just going to be just fine hanging out here. Playing EverQuest. Sitting in the same spot for the last <laughs> four and a half hours. <laughs> just talking about video games. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, four and a half hours. We are still doing the haiku book, by the way, for folks who want to have one. Um, like, this year we are still collecting haikus. So, Channel Point Redemptions give you for haikus get put into a new book for 2022 for the end of the year. Like, that stuff's fun. Modwolf wants a monster manual. Holy smokes. Oh, no. We, we go down the list. We did Alizusaurus. We are going to do what's next. Because I want to make sure I don't do doubles. That's why I get weird about this stuff. Um, Where is my thing? Hold on. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, that's where it is. Um. <laughs> Oops. Oh, jeez. 
Let me pull it up. Da, 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 da. Where did it go? My That's odd. Hold on. We'll get it. No. Why in the world? Where did it go? Hold on. Technical difficulties. I'm going to pull it up one second. There it is. Monsters of Nora. Thank you. All right. Let's get it pulled up one second. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Bam. Bam. Monsters of Norath. We did the Elisasaur. You want to do a frog luck? I can do a frog luck for you since we're here, right? Let's do a frog luck talk. We'll do one. We'll get you frog lucks. Where are you, frog lucks? Kazakh Thule. Oh, the poor little Chitari. Dark Necromancers. Drachnids. Dragons. Elementals. Evil Eyes. We're almost there. Frog Locks. Here we go. It is. Because I asked my old phone. Uh, I didn't even realize that was on there. Uh, my old phone. I had like just downloaded so many PDFs. Yeah, Sakura says, I love when people observe how hard it is to get anywhere streaming, and I'm like, try streaming 20-plus-year-old obscure PC games. Yep, Sakura. All right, here we go. Frog locks. Let's get a description. Frog locks are a reclusive race. race. A frog lock, frog-like humanoid creatures that inhabit Norath's swamps and underground abodes. They generally prefer to be left alone, but it is not unheard of for them to trade with some of Norath's races. Since ogres and trolls feast on small froglocks from a young age, however, froglocks will either attack or flee from those races on sight, unless an individual ogre or troll has somehow proven itself friendly. In addition to dozens of scattered tribes throughout Norath, froglocks have two large kingdoms on the known continents. The kingdom of Guk lies in southern Antonica near Inethul Swamp. The froglock nobility of Guk lead their kingdom through several dire threats. The trolls of Grob pose a constant danger to Guk, but the more dangerous enemy lies far below the surface. In the deepest caverns of Guk, legions of froglocks have been cursed with a form of ghoulish undeath. The lower reaches of Guk often clamor with battle between the living froglocks and their undead brethren, who seek to claim all of Guk as their own. Froglock nobility carries a confusing array of titles, which are generally earned through one's ability rather than through herald heredity. Although, as with all societies, some froglocks of inferior prowess are promoted for political reasons. In ascending order of importance, these titles include Tuk, Gaz, Ton, Vis, Shin, Shinta, Tal, Nokta, Tonta, Su, Tal, Erd, Dar, Wan, Kor, Yun, Zol, and finally, Guk, for those nobles who receive orders directly from the king. Outsiders who seek to deal with froglocks are best served to recognize these stations to avoid breaches of diplomatic etiquette. The other major froglock kingdom lies below the ruined Ixar city of Sebelis, in southern Kunark. Here the froglocks are beholden to Trakanon, their great dragon ruler. The froglocks of Sebelis are more aggressive than the Antonican kin, sallying forth in great numbers to expand their empire throughout Trakanon's teeth into the Swamp of No Hope and even to the very walls of the Ixar city of Cavalus and the high elf outposts of Uriana V. The 
Frog Lux and Sebelus are awarded noble titles, similar to the Kin and Guk, with the addition of such higher ranks as Bok, Jin, Krupp, Illis, and the highest station, Reet, for those powerful ones who hold audience with Trakanon himself. There you are. Monster Manual. Bam. Is this it? Are we going to win this one? Is it going to be it? An Executioner's Hood? Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Oh my god, is this it? What does this do? Magic item. Head. No, it's not it. Oh, man. Pumpkin says, I am drooling over this book. I would use this in one of my D&D campaigns for sure. It is three, like a 3.5, I believe. Oh, it's not. It's not. But I can wear it, though. I am encumbered. It's a dex and strength increase. That's big. That's big. So close. It's a mask. That's not a mask. That's a hood. By the way, Punkface, welcome to the stream. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, yeah. Uh, I believe that the EverQuest um, tabletop RPG system was a modification of 3.5, I think. Am I crazy? No, it's not the thing. Yeah. Um, I love using the monsters form that monster manual and other RPGs. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. More frog locks, please. Frog locks are the best. They're the best monster. Um, let me see. Let me go look that up, actually. Um, EverQuest Tabletop RPG. So, Wizard of the Coast. The D20 system. At the time, so that would have been, what, 3rd edition? Yeah. Yeah. It's a modified version of it, yeah. No mask. Well, we got a really great Executioner's Hood. That like, That's fantastic. I mean, that's a big one. Right? I'm invisible right now, so I can't even see it, but... We do have to call it a night, so we have to make the trek out, which is going to be fun. We're going to have to fight our way out. Because I have to get some sleep. <laughs> We got uh, some great stuff for my rogue. <clears throat> we got some awesome pauldrons. Got a better ham a hammer, which is cool. You stay here and I'll kill a head. Okay, I'm staying here. Um, Yeah, man, I really enjoy it. There's really great lore in the tabletop RPG book for, for the EverQuest stuff. There's a lot of really great lore of a lot of zones and stuff like that. It's really interesting. That was one of the big reasons as to why I got the books in the first place. Um, that was during a time when I was accruing just tons and tons and tons of weird tabletop RPG systems. So, like, for instance, there's a tabletop RPG system for Street Fighter 2. Um, a bunch of weird ones. So all these really strange and obscure ones, stuff that's people made for like video games and just weird, weird things. They're all in that backup file, uh, backup folder. Um, and also getting some of the old stuff that I really liked that I don't have access to anymore. I had given to Nick and I wanted to get back like Mage the Ascension and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was weird. There's a lot of weird, weird ones that people did. Huh. There's some weird things in my backup folder. Yeah, my downloads in my backup folder is filled with just strange things. <laughs> Gifts. Oh, that's one I should use. There's one of a gif of uh, the bard from Wandersong dancing. And I'm like, that should be an emote. That should be an emote. Wondersong bard dancing as a gif. 
Um, yeah, man. What a weird day. This is a weird stream. <laughs> this is the weirdest stream I've ever done of just sitting here for four, almost five hours, talking, just sitting here, trying to get this mask that everyone is like, you don't have that mask yet? It's like, nope, hasn't popped up. Hasn't popped up. No mask for me. I wanted to experience EverQuest, Hesh. This is true. This is the dark side of EverQuest. RNG is a cruel mistress. To say the least, Mod Wolf's like, I think it's rough for you. I'm the one who had to do everything. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. And Hesh, Hesh, aren't you glad that your client crashed? <laughs> You're like, I didn't have to sit here for four and a half hours. I'm glad, I'm glad, Hesh, that you didn't end up, um, that you didn't end up having to tag along for this. Because that would have been tough. And I wouldn't want to, I made it back. In, but I wouldn't have hung around more than 30 minutes anyways. That's good. I'm glad. Mod was like, I got probably 400p worth of vendor trash. That's I guess that's a win. That's a win. Um, Yeah, I got, I got some major equipment improvements. I'll take those every day. Why is my inventory not? There we go. Popping up. Yeah, I mean, the pauldrons, the executioner's hood's a big one for me. The strength and dex? I need that. I need that strength. That strength. To increase my movement speed and my weight allowance. My goodness. It's so terrible. And that hammer's going to help. That's a big damage buff than what I had before. So it was very helpful, Mod Wolf. I mean this truly. It was a, it was a major help. It helped boosted me a little bit. I don't mind being twinked out with this character. A lot of times I'm very much like, I like to do it in like the natural progression of things. The stream character, I'm like, anything goes. Anything goes. Um, for this character in particular, because I always do natural progression and I end up never getting like anywhere. And so I want to just take things a little more easy, loosen up the reins a little bit. But yeah, I enjoy this a bunch. I just gotta get out now. That's the real, the real challenge. Do, 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 do. So yeah, I'll be back on Monday. We're gonna play. I have to um, pay my dues. We are playing. What is this called? Mushihime sama is what I'm playing. I law the bag will carry more loot. This is true as well. The bag, yes. Um uh clean last mob, then we can move to the next section. Excellent. Um Mushihime sama is a cave shmup. I have to play because I failed at winning um my fantasy games league. And so I have to play that for a stream. So Monday we'll be playing that. I am staying close. Down the stairs. Okay. I heard something. I got hit by that spell. Ooh, that's a bunch of guys. Oh, 
Oh, don't die. Oh. <laughs> no way. Oh my god. Uh How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Or did you think you were going to bed? Yeah. I requested no. <laughs> I requested no. Oh, did you think did you think that you were gonna go to bed? Uh, no. I'm sorry. You wanted that mask? So something saw you on the bottom floor and trained up everything. Oh no, Mod Wolf, are you okay? I did not realize that was the case. I am so sorry. Please tell me you didn't die. I lived with 2%. I got my feigned death off. Oh my gosh. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not good at this game. <laughs> I told you. I told you, Mod Wolf, I was not good at this game. I was told you I was not good at this game. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You spent all that time. And then I almost dashed everything. How bad is it? Okay. You speed this up by pointing me to South Row and dragging my body to the zone that I can get to South Row, I think, but just Kunononi says I might have to give this game a try. Kunononi, you've never played EverQuest? Play Project 1999. I think the, the classic way of playing the game is very different than modern day. But um Uh it's fantastic. It's really interesting. Oh my gosh, the world building alone is so fantastic. So um, I'll start making my way. Do you want me to start moving or do you want me to stay there, uh, Mod Wolf? So think of it like this, Kunononi. This is what's so interesting about the game. Um, there's no linear progression. There's every zone typically has like something for somebody. Um, and there's always some major dangers in every zone. But like, oh, sure. Slash consent warm knee. Okay. Um, so, like, for instance, say you want to make a human uh, paladin and you start in Kinos. Right? You, want to, you want to start in Kinos. Um, you got the city of Kinos at your disposal, right? And there's quests and things you can do and, and hunting grounds and all this great stuff. But wait, you, and there'll be quests that'll be talking about these people called the Blood Sabers and this this evil group that is hidden within the the catacombs and the aqueducts of of Kinos the underground you know sewers of Kinos and um you'll do quests that might like give you info on like the the plot with this this thing um and give you lots of pieces of information but if you made a necromancer in Kinos Head to West Commonlands. Gotcha. Um, if you are a necromancer in Kinos, your guild is in the sewers, and they'll give you directions to all the um, the ways to navigate these secret passages to lead to where the Blood Saber's headquarters is. That's where your guild master is, and they give you quests and stuff like this. That is really about them trying to undermine the city. Cast an invis on you so you can travel through Upper Guck with ease and have Spirit of the Wolf. Oh, this is just too nice. Uh, so where do I meet you, Mod Wolf, then? I don't know where the Druid Rings would be. I actually don't know where they are. Because I'm not, I'm not good at this game. <laughs> I feel bad. I feel so bad. I'm here where the road begins. Um, and so yeah, Kunononi, there's just a world. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, it's just, it's fascinating. Kuno no Oni, just the way that they build quests. There are these interconnected stories and quest lines that you don't get the full picture of unless you're playing from a different perspective. So, for instance, right, the ogres have this quest line, they, these quests, that allude to the idea that the dark elves aren't holding up their end of the bargain in their alliance uh, between the dark elves, the trolls, and the ogres in fighting for the forces of evil in Antonica. The ogres are like, the dark elves are hiding something. They're not holding up their end of the bargain. Um, and like, you can find out that like they're setting up to betray the ogres and work with the trolls to betray the ogres because the ogres are too historically too powerful. Um, and, but then if you play as like a dark elf, oh, you're very aware of this trolls, <clears throat> very aware of this ogres. You're not aware of this at all. And it's just really interesting. <coughs> Ooh. To see that stuff kind of happen um, and like discover these things. It's super interesting. I'm on the move. Because I'm guessing... Oh, wait. Am I in West or I'm in East Commonlands right now? I think I'm in... Where am I? I'm in East. I'm sorry. I'm dumb. I was like, yeah, I'm in West Commonlands. I'm not. I'm in East Commonlands. I'm not smart. I'm so dumb. I'll get there, Mod Wolf. I'll get there. I was sitting there just chatting. The game is magical. There's so many ups and downs. I mean, it's brutal. I don't have any items. I died. <laughs> so it's a long trek. Um, back to reclaim my body and to get safely there. No worries, Mod Wolf. <clears throat> I'll get there eventually. Take your time. You're doing so much for me already. So, um, yeah, it's just that EverQuest is a very challenging game. It requires a uh, reliance on other people and working together. To overcome these obstacles, there's a lot of world of discovery and a lot of world of experimentation. I love the regurgitonic, if anyone has ever heard about that. Like, I think that's the coolest thing. Um, and not a lot of people talk about that. Uh, regurgitonic is this thing. Um, there's like a quest line where the druids and rangers in uh, the Kinos area revere this, this bear, this holy bear. It's acting strange. And so they need you to go to Akanon, City of Gnomes, which is incredibly far away. It's as far away as possibly could be. You know, the farthest point from Kinos is Akanon. <laughs> like, it's so far away. You have to go make this really incredibly dangerous trek to Freeport to get on a boat to get to the continent of Fadewar. And then, you know, go through the Butcher Block Mountains uh, to the Greater Fate Arc, to get to um, to get to the Steamfont Mountains, to then get to Akanon, to get this medicine, the Regurgitonic. And it's the thing that makes you per puke, right? But there are other quests where you need to get these things, um, like you need to get these, this or these orders, these plans, or like a list of names or something for Kinos. And there's this dog that ate it. This guy, his his dog ate it. And so you could just kill the dog. And um uh and if you kill the dog, you get it, but you get a major faction hit for doing it. But if you give it the Regurgitonic, which you'd have to get by doing that that druid quest line, um you uh it vomits it up and you don't get the uh you don't get the faction hit. Model says there's a quest where you kill something in Steamfont Mountains and turn it into Kinos for a very nice bracer, but that isn't until level 35. It's such a long travel. It's such a long travel. Oh, whoops. Sorry. I'm terrible at this. 
Oh. Sorry, wrong thing. Hooray! Did I zone and not know also? I don't think so. I did not, okay. You also need faction, yeah. All good, off we go. I'm like, I wasn't paying attention. When I get into talking with chat, I'm even worse at this game. Um, but it's so fascinating to experience these games. All right, so Desert of Row. Hi, everybody. Now, where am I going? I'm going south. Right? Okay, following you. You're going to guide me. You're my Sherpa. Through this dangerous world known as EverQuest. Um. So it's just so much fun. Part of the, the, the beauty of this game is, is exploration, experimentation. Um, and discovery. And just playing around. You will have the highest highs and the lowest lows. And that is part of what makes this game so special. Um, if you die, you lose all your stuff unless you go reclaim your body. Which means you have to go rely and talk to other people to get it back. And that stuff takes time, and it takes, you know, trust and effort, because, you know, it's a lot of risk for people. And so for some of them, that's not, you know, it's going to... If I tried to do this without the help of Mod Wolf, one, I would invariably fail without question. And two... If I tried to get my body back, most people would be like, what is wrong with you? Why did you think this was a thing you could do? I'll help you, but oh my gosh. Michael's shenanigans is absolutely fantastic during Abnub. Absolutely. I love him to death. <clears throat> Whenever I want to feel hyped to play EverQuest, I watch his videos. They're hilarious. They're so great. I mean, that's why I call them, you know, the Tunnel Fat Cats. It's from him. Tunnel Fat Cats. I mean, they are Tunnel Fat Cats. They will forever be. But my despise for, um, if I did play, I'd either be a Wood Elf Ranger or Halfling Rogue. Look, they're both fantastic, Kuna no Oni. Rangers are, fant are, are uh, I think, are really cool. You get tracking. And uh, the Rogues... Rogues are great. Dual wield, backstab, stealth and stuff. Invisible. Their sneak and hide is bar none. Okay, I'm running. I'm not stopping because I'm sure they're going to... Oh, yeah, no, they like me. Um, And uh, Halfling was really cool because uh, the I like the zones for Halflings. They're really kind of easy and accessible. And I like the city, too. It's great. Yeah, they're apprehensive to me. Okay. A T machine. Well, we got a port, which helped make the travel a little easier. And I'm getting some invisibility from a, a lovely, lovely uh, druid. Just making it so that they don't see me. These guys aren't much of a threat for me right at this moment. Um, they are... Um, the frog locks are apprehensive to me because I'm not hunting them. So that's helpful, at least. And they're going to take me to the zone line. I I consented with Mod Wolf so that they would um, drag, they can drag my corpse to the zone line. Well, apprehensive just means that they're wary of me. So if that's that's to say that they won't kill me on sight. They don't just attack on sight. They're wary of me. Um, and so I consented so, so to um, 
to Mod Wolf so that they can drag my corpse. They have a command that allows them to move my corpse. Um, and they took it, of course, to the zone line where this begins so that I can easily just grab it and then I can head back. Which is a great tool to no end. Like, people will pay... Sorry, which way did you go? I'm sorry. I totally got lost. I do not, I do not see you. Mod Wolf, I've lost you. Is it this way? On my way back. Oh, yeah. I'm so lost. I'm going to stay in where I was. Um. There. Okay. Hi. Sorry. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't go the way that I planned on going because that was the wrong way. <laughs> um. So, like, people pay, like, top dollar for a rogue because they can sneak and hide and it is pretty much not noticeable okay oh geez i went hold on i went back through and um and they can drag corpses and just like not be detected i went back the wrong way Entering the ruins of old Guck. Okay. There's my court. Oh my gosh. Sognesty, you beautiful bastard. What have they done to you? Thank you so much. Okay. Um, uh, you can port me to the, back to the common lands, I guess. That would be nice. If you kill the undead uh, frogs, you get plus faction with the living ones. Ooh, fun. Um, there's a thing that EverQuest 2 did that I loved so much that doesn't happen very much. In EverQuest 1. Um, it does with uh, um, the Karens in Kara Isle. Um, but having, like, I'd love for if you're nice with the frog locks that they would give you quests. Do they do that here? Maybe I'm, I just don't know. Do they give you quests here if they like you? And, uh, because I know they do in Kara Island. I'm in the Dreadlands. Hold on. How do I... Whoa. Where's the Dreadlands? I've never been to the Dreadlands. Wrong spell. <laughs> I was like, uh, I've never been here. I've never been to the Dreadlands. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, like, these places that are typically hunting grounds for a lot of people, if you're good in a faction, you can actually do quests for them. Welcome to Kunark. Oh, God. This is the opposite of where I want to be. Um, but like in um, the island of Otis, the island continent of Otis where the erudites are, um, if you make an erudite character, uh, Kara Island, or cat people, an island of cat people, and they're like kill on sight with you. They don't like erudites because erudites drove them from their homeland to this little remote island. Um, but if you're other races... They are indifferent or apprehensive. Oh my gosh, thank you. You're a lifesaver. Dude, Mod Wolf, seriously, thank you. Um, You really made my day. Like, it was a fun time. I enjoyed this stream. I enjoyed this stream a bunch. We had a lot of fun. Why is that not a valid command? Um, And I... You go there, and there's a there's a town there, and you could like talk to them. They have a lot of things to say. There are quests that they can give, and there is like a story there on that island. But if you're an erudite, and for a lot of people, they just go there to hunt. You know, it's not a common place for people to go though. But um, and it's magical. It's like my favorite place, my favorite place in the whole game. All right, 
Uh, Mod Wolf, thank you a million times. I need to go east. There's east, that's west. Let's go east. We're going to the east common lands a little bit to get to safety. And then I'm going to log off and go to sleep. Um, But for real, Mod Wolf, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate dramatically, <laughs> dramatically, all the help. You didn't have to, and yet you still did. And for that, I am forever grateful. We'll get those masks one day. Maybe not the next time I stream. But we'll get that mask one day. One day. <laughs> Fun times! Not getting it. Which everyone's just like... I, I was watching that OOC chat. And people were like, are you for real? <laughs> Still hasn't popped? Like, nope. Hasn't popped. Hasn't popped. Oh my gosh, I gotta get some sleep though, I'm exhausted. It's almost 2 o'clock in the morning, my wife's gonna be very mad at me. I still gotta read a bunch of a book. Um, and <laughs> for a podcast? Which is gonna be a lot of work. With no sleep. But you know what? It was worth it. One day. One day, maybe not today. But maybe tomorrow. We gotta go find an inn. <laughs> it's sleep in a bed. <sighs> I think their beds are very comfy. Yeah, turn up for seriously. Have a good night, man. Thank you so much for coming in and hanging out. There are so many animals right now. Okay, we are going to sleep on this bed. Oops. It doesn't do anything, but I'm going to do it anyways. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. So, let's go full screen. Who are we going to raid tonight? we got to find someone to raid. We'll be back Monday night... 8 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be playing Mushe Hime-sama, a cave shmup. Uh, let's go say hi to Knight Rider. Uh, he's streaming right now, which is abnormal for him. I mean, I guess maybe not. I'm not on at 2 o'clock in the morning. A big fan of, of uh, EverQuest. He's playing The Last of Us for the very first time. Never played it before, so let's go say hi to them. Hesh, it's always a pleasure. He's a big uh, EverQuest fan. And just the nicest guy in the whole world. Alright, I'll see you guys Monday night, 8pm. I'm going to go to sleep. And, of course, the game crashed. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> oh my gosh.